All right, good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the special called meeting of the Milton City Council for Monday, August 8, 2016, to order. Sue, if you'll please call the roll and make general announcements. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'll be happy to call roll for the August 8, 2016, special called meeting. I will waive the reading of the rules and general announcements and move on to the roll call. Mayor Joe Lockwood. Here. Councilmember Karen Thurman. Here. Councilmember Matt Coons. Here. Councilmember Bill Lutz. Here. Councilmember Bert Hewitt is absent for the record. Councilmember Joe Longoria. Here. Councilmember Rick Morin. Here. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everybody. I know uh, most of you are here for our work session, which will start in just a few minutes, but uh, we've got one item of business we need to take care of. So, um, Sudi, if you'll please uh, call the next item, which is approval of the agenda. Next item is approval of the meeting agenda. Go agenda ahead. item number 16172. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. second. I have a motion from Councilmember Thurman, second by Councilmember Longoria. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. Do you have any public comment? I do not. Okay. All right. We'll move on to new business. Sudi, so call the item. Consideration of a corrupted intergovernmental agreement for the provision of election services between Fulton County, Georgia, and the city of Milton, Georgia. Agenda item number 16173, Mr. Ken Gerard. Mayor, members of the council, thank you very much. You have at this uh, special call meeting consideration of a corrected copy of the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Milton, Fulton County, and the Port Fulton County Board of Elections and Registrations with respect to the Board of Elections and Registrations conduct of the City of Milton November uh, referendum uh, with respect to the general obligation bond. Uh, the City Council may recall that you had previously adopted a version of this intergovernmental agreement. Uh, regrettably, that was a version that did not contain some very minor tweaks um, that are actually in the version that was supposed to be in front of you. We are doing this tonight merely as a housekeeping measure. And so when, in fact, we ask you to make a motion to approve this corrected agreement, we are going to ask that that motion declare that this intergovernmental agreement replaces and supersedes the version that may have been previously approved by the City Council. Um, I will tell you that this, the version you have in front of you, is in fact the version that has been approved by Fulton County as well as the Board of Elections and Registrations. And I will also tell you that the call of election for that November ballot is going out uh, either on August 9th or 10th. So it's imminent. We need to get this done today. And also I will tell the council what I think you already know, which is we've had some good news with respect to the costs associated with the election in November. And I believe that maybe a commissioner, uh, Commissioner Hausman, may have been responsible for that. But that is, is that they are going to uh, remove actual the costs in the IGA and I will tell you council members rather than go through on an IGA that everybody else had already approved and start marking up the payment shifting we're going to resolve it by way of just letters between us uh, indicating what our responsibilities are going to be so that's very good news and there may be some of you that, that, that share some credit for that but Mr. Mayor all I'm asking um, this evening is for there to be a motion by the council to approve the IGA at your stations and that the approval of this IGA, this corrected IGA, will replace and supersede the prior IGA uh, on this topic. Okay. Any questions? Okay. All right. I'll open up for a motion. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we uh, approve a corrected intergovernmental agreement for the provision of election services between Fulton County, Georgia, and the city of Milton, Georgia, agenda item number 16-173, and that this um, this particular item before us here on August 8, 2016 replaces and supersedes the previous uh, agreement for the City Council. Second motion. Okay, I have a motion for approval from Councilmember Coons, second from Councilmember Lust. Uh, just want to say, you know, to, to get your point, yeah, I know Karen had talked to Councilmember or, or Commissioner Hausman, um, and uh, I talked to the chairman, and uh, just, you know, kudos to the county and, you know, talked about just level-headed government where we all decide, you know, our citizens are paying for the cost of an election. Uh, by adding this bond on there, it's really not adding, other than some paper, it's not adding any more work. So uh, kudos and, and thanks to not only the chairman, but Commissioner, Commissioner uh, Hausman and, and, and Ellis and the rest of the Fulton County guys to uh, work with us and treat our citizens fair. So 
That's my spiel. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimous. Thank you. All right. Uh, sure. That's concluded. So, I have a motion, to adjourn. motion to adjourn. Second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay. Well, welcome everybody to the August 8th special call joint work session. And the work sessions are a more informal setting to update the council on business items. No votes will be taken on work session items. Tonight there are seven items on the agenda. Public comment is allowed that is germane to an agenda item. If you wish to speak, you are required to fill out a public comment card and turn it into the city clerk. Public comment will be allowed for a total of 10 minutes per agenda item and no more than two minutes per person. Public comment will be heard at the beginning of this item. Once the item is called, no other public cards will be accepted. So do we have any public cards for item number one? We have RZ 1518, which is two, and then one that just says rule you shed. Okay. So. All right, well, if you would uh, please call the item, agenda item number one. Mr. Mayor, uh, just, just a point of, of order. Um, I think we've got a few minutes till six oh, o'clock. I'm sorry. You know, I think I'm we 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 might want to trying to be efficient. Here. And, and I didn't want to get in your way. I was thinking, I get it, but uh, we might want to wait and just make sure everybody's here. Okay. We want to be here. Um, yeah, I apologize. I'm just moving right into the meeting, but we do formally have uh, five more minutes before. And I guess point of order, we really don't even need to be discussing it until. Right. Make Correct. sure everybody has right. opportunities. The meeting's been called to order, but we'll just need to we just need to sit. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, Karen, if you would pass the snack to Steve, <laughs> Steve, if you would pass the snack jar around to you the public. Got it. <laughs> I will say though, it's really nice when both the city and county realize we uh, we represent the same constituents Anybody? and that yeah. we're doing what's best for them with the the election. We're sharing the sharing the love here. <laughs> She called me a I'm trying to be good. Oh, well, don't keep them down here. We were outside of Zurich, but mainly we spent most of the time in some organizations based with the Zurich one, based the latter one. I think you're in the Swiss Southern 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 it's um, stunning. It's clean. It's beautiful. Oh, look, handouts. <laughs> yeah. It's so exciting. But if it's a, so I think it was. We're going to break the curve.
Yeah, 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 do we need to start I really, really know, or, 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 I think just recognize that you already <laughs> recognize. <laughs> yeah, just recognize okay. you already started. All right. Can everybody hear me? Good, e good evening. And as most of you know that we're here, we've already uh, just recognizing the fact that we have uh, started the meeting, and uh, but we have waited till six o'clock to get into the meat of it. So, that's right. So, if you could please sound the first agenda item. First item is discussion of capital improvement elements, CIE, Ms. Michelle McIntosh Ross. Good evening. Um, as you know, um, we, as Milton, we approved uh, impact fee ordinance last October in the fall, and with that, there are some state requirements for annual updates of the uh, capital improvement element and the uh, work program items um, <coughs> that are impact fee eligible. So we are here tonight to discuss the draft annual update for the CIE and to seek direction to move forward to next week to submit, um, to approve a resolution to transmit the document to Georgia DCA and the um, Atlanta Regional Commission for their review and comment. Uh, and then after that, sometime in October, October 17th is our schedule, uh, we would come back to um, seek approval of the uh, final document. Um, our impact fee consultants are here, Ross and Associates, to lead the discussion. And, um, and he's available for questions um, tonight, not next week. So if you have questions, we want to get them in tonight. And um, so I'll just turn it over to Bill Ross. Thank you, Michelle. I'm Bill Ross with Ross Associates. We're located in, in Atlanta. Um, this is something you will see every year. Being a impact fee community, you're required to submit a so-called, they call it an annual update. It's not much of an update at all. But uh, you file this, this uh, annual report. Uh, it, it has two parts. There's a financial uh, 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 report section, and then there's an update to your, your five-year short-term work program. Um, the latter, you add another year and chop off last year so that you've always got a rolling five-year community work program. And you're probably familiar with the community work program because it's part of the, your comprehensive plan um, also. The financial report basically says, what did you get? What did you do with it? How much did you keep? How much did you spend? What did you spend on it? Now, because this report uh, uh, contains the last fiscal year, you didn't start collecting impact fees till about three days after that, or maybe five days after uh, that fiscal year. So you probably noticed on the tables in this report, lots of blanks because you didn't collect any impact fees on those those, uh, those in in that fiscal year. Next annual report, you'll you'll be reporting fiscal year 2016 um, at that time. But what we did do is go ahead and structure all of these tables and get the list of projects in there and the amount of uh, uh, impact fee eligibility and whatnot, so that the model would already be in place. Staff can take this role over if they get tired of paying me to, to, to come and do it for you um, and start filling these up, these forms out uh, themselves. Um, I want to emphasize that this is based on the capital improvements element that you adopted uh, last year. Um, and that stays in place until such time as you need to, to revise it. You go through a CIE amendment process, send the state a new version uh, for review, and when that comes back, uh, adopt it at that time. Uh, so this one is, re is based on your, your current CIE. If you make any major changes, you'll need a new CIE. Um, well, it just depends on when you need to change it, because only you will, you will know that, and the staff will keep track uh, keep track of it. If I can answer any questions about this, um, as Michelle indicated, uh, at your next meeting, there'll be a public hearing, which is required by the state. Um, you will then transmit, uh, adopt a, a, a resolution to transmit the report to ARC. ARC sends a copy to, to DCA. 
Uh, it goes as a draft. That's why it says draft on the, uh, on the report. Uh, once the ARC and DCA have made whatever comments they care to make and whatever uh, resolution there may be, you will have a final version approved by the state that you can then adopt. Uh, and, you, and that's not a public hearing. That's just an action by you. And depending on the comments from the state, there may be some minor changes here and there. They'll just be incorporated. We don't have to keep going through the review process over and over and over again. Okay. Any questions for Bill? Okay. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Do we have any other questions for staff from Michelle? Or Care? We haven't actually spent any of our funds that we have received thus far from impact fees yet, have we? Um, not that I know of. Um, I know it's been, um, we've looked at the uh, impact fee eligible items and we're working our accounting to fund those with um, spreadsheets and all. So I don't know that we've actually paid for any items with the impact fee money, but we've allotted. Um, and I'm assuming along with this next year's budget, we will be seeing information concerning what has been collected and what we plan to spend it on. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank okay. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, while you're up there. <laughs> All of these separate uh, budgets for the different departments, parks, fire, uh, law enforcement, and the others, uh, you have allocated amounts for starting in 2016 and ending in 35, and then 22 ending in 35. Uh, how will those be allocated on a annual basis I guess yeah every year we'll look at them again to make edits to those dates if necessary um, is there any specifics on that? um, that's as far as I know um, we'll look at them every year and uh, make adjustments to those dates um, yeah, we don't have to spend them every year right. um, then oh. you have to spend the money after you have seven years in which to recover the funds so we can literally save the money as, uh, for a couple of years before we decide to allocate it to a specific project. And that will come out through the budgetary process. Um, okay. But uh, we'll co collect the money, and then those are the projects we've identified that are eligible for impact fees. Um, and so uh, some years we, we may spend less than other years, depending on the project. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, Bill Ross again. This report is designed for and answers questions raised by DCA. I don't want anybody in this room to believe this is real. It's not not real, but what happens is you in your annual budgeting process, you'll decide what you're going to spend money on and when and those could be revisions to your whole program, uh, including where's the money going to come from that's not coming from impact fees. You may also be faced with some interim funding things. The impact fees come in rather slowly. You don't get the last fee until the last house is built 20 years from now. But in some cases, you'll have some interim funding issues. You want to go ahead and get a fire station built. You want to go ahead and get something done. You don't have all the impact fees in yet. You can uh, use interim financing to build what you want to build, and then as the impact fees come in, they transfer into the general fund or a bond fund or whatever to pay yourselves back for what you, what you spent. The reality is much more complicated than this little report that DCA dreamed of. So that's how it, that's how it happens in a, in a real world kind of sense. You'll see it through the budgeting process every year. Good explanation. Rick? I know it's on here we've got some projects that have already been completed, like going back to 2014. Are those just put on there, for example, say 
because it's saying max funding from impact fees and obviously the project is done was that just as an example for public works to say had we had impact fees this is what you could have maxed because these are closed projects yes and you can uh, those projects are impact fee eligible even though they may be completed you can recoup the money that was spent on those projects that benefited future development and that's why we carry them forward they're listed in that CIE I mentioned and they'll still be listed even when they're when they're actually paid off entirely but uh, even though the project is complete uh, the the city can transfer funds as you get them and as you desire can transfer them into the general fund or whatever fund to pay yourselves back for the capacity you created for for new development such so as an accounting accounting option exactly Okay. All right. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Michelle. All right, City, if you'll please call the second item. Our next item is discussion of RZ 1518 to amend the AG1 Agricultural District, Chapter 64, Article 6, Division 2. Ms. Kathy Field. Yes. Um, uh, just a point of information, I did pass out to all of you a um, revised um, the, uh, on the AG1, um, and, and as you know, all the changes are the same for all the zoning residents and zoning districts. I did pass out to you the AG1 as well as the uh, change to the uh, rural view shed, and because in there, are, in yellow, are the changes that you uh, requested at the last meeting that we had when we discussed this particular topic. So I didn't want those. Um, changes to be lost, so they are in yellow in the uh, document that I, I passed out to you, and so they've been captured. Okay. Um, at the last meeting, you did ask for a um, work session with the uh, planning commission members to discuss uh, their comments and viewpoints as it relates to the proposed changes, and the um, four planning commission members are here this evening have that discussion with you. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, with your permission, I'm just going to sit down for a sure. while, and then I'll be available to answer any questions. Okay. Um, I want to thank you guys from the Planning Commission for being here. Um, do we have any public comment? We, we do have two on that first, <clears throat> on the oh. second item. I'll go ahead and hear the public comment, that way. So we discuss things we might can answer. And the first one is Laura Bentley. Hi there, uh, Laura Bentley, 2500 Bethany Church Road. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to have this work session. Um, it, it's a good thing that we're taking our time to uh, really get this right. I think it's important to it's important to me, but I think it's also important to a lot of citizens. Um, the rural view shed is like a green space corridor. And um, I handed out some pictures because the more you look at it, the more you think about it, and the more you appreciate it. And so I thought some pictures might be helpful to your discussions here tonight. Um, in the pictures, you're going to see, I hope, what we can all agree are view sheds that we just do not need to touch. They should be considered do not disturb view sheds. Um, we have some other great view sheds that um, might have needed some improvements and then we have some view sheds where you're driving by and you go what the heck happened here and so I think we have an opportunity now to um, really look at this uh, ordinance get it right so that we can continue to be the community that's known people come here just to drive around um, so with that, um, I would like to go on the, the very first page. The reason I included this, um, this is a picture over at Bethany's Rest. Um, this is about 10 years old. It's a mature view shed that I think is beautiful and could probably be used as an example of something when we have a new AG1 development. I would really like to see this rather than the backs of homes. The next, um, set of pictures is the new development on Nixon Freemanville. Um, 
definitely a view shed that has been disturbed and we need to talk about how that happened and why it happened. Um, I believe there was some kudzu there. Um, so that's an important topic in your, dis in your discussions. Um, there were also some nice trees in the view shed, but they probably didn't qualify as Olympic athlete trees, but I still think we should keep them. Across the, the street, that bottom picture, that's the view shed across from Nixon Freemanville, and I hope we can all agree that that is a no improvement, don't touch view shed. Um, the next page is the Grove over at Ashton Woods, which I thought was a great example of a view shed that was enhanced. Um, the, the existing oaks were used, and then um, that developer planted beautiful magnolia trees to screen the backs of the AG1 homes. And the, um, the pea gravel uh, uh, trail is, I think, worked really nice there. So that's kind of what you notice when you drive around, well, wow, that's a great example. Let's do that everywhere or do a variation of it everywhere. We don't want to be cookie cutter. Um, the next set of pictures is Providence. Um, well, Bert's not here yet, but this is Bert's neighborhood. Um, Providence and Bethany, which I think is the most beautiful uh, tree canopy in our city. And I certainly hope that that would be considered a, a no improvement view shed, but I will point out, and I, I do like kudzu. I like kudzu more than orange dirt. There is a tree there that has kudzu on it, so that's another thing to talk about. Um, but I'd hate to see that touched in any way. Um, the next set of pictures is Blue Valley, which this just makes me mad altogether because um, it's actually one of our most beautiful areas that has um, not uh, turned out, I'm sure, the way we would all like. Um, there's, there's a hideous looking sign in the view shed. Um, I think due to variances, we have swing sets in the view shed. We have some three foot Lelands that are 10 feet apart that are dying in the view shed. Um, so we have a chance to, to fix this and I'm just wondering why this one can't be like um, the Grove. The last picture is um, um, there's corn in the view shed and there's pumpkins and then there's horses and I'm all for bona fide at AG1 use in the view shed. Um, just as an aside, those horses, if you make people do plantings, um, they're going to eat them and they're going to rub on them and they're going to knock them over. And so I think the horses should can be considered the plantings. So um, just some suggestions as you go about your business tonight. Um, Please consider keeping the original language, which was 40 foot and undisturbed. Um, let's do a better job of enforcing the original view, view shed language, um, which would protect trees other than specimen inheritance trees in the view shed. Um, one suggestion would be that council and staff approve landscape designs for standardized plantings. Um, which screen the backs of the a new AG1 developments. Um, maybe you need to have a discussion about the removal of invasive plants and maybe that needs to be done via a, a variant so that it's not left to one person to decide, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna take this view shed out because there was kudzu there. Um, in favor of bona fide AG1 use in the view shed. And then finally, I'd like to, as soon as you all decide, you, we really need to get to um, educating the community about if they, are, if they have a view shed, what they can and can't do, and also the tree service companies that might come and cut down trees in the view shed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did you say we have two comments? Yes, we have another one. And that's Mr. Cleveland Slater. Cleveland Slater, 13670 Bethany Road. Um, I handed out earlier a sheet with some highlights on it. The, the first couple of sentences is our existing view shed ordinance. It's pretty simple. Uh, it says we have a 40 foot undisturbed buffer. Uh, and then it continues in the second sentence. 
the state for sparsely vegetated replant the undisturbed buffer in a natural fashion. Um, there was a lot of discussion about inability to plant in the undisturbed buffer, and that's why we needed to change the ordinance. Uh, so I, wanna, I want you to look at that language, and I, I can understand there may be some conflict between undisturbed and planning, but I think it's simply that it is undisturbed except but plantings that are required where we have a sparsely vegetated buffer. Um, the second in the red is a portion of the proposed text amendment. And the language there changed from an undisturbed buffer to a primary setback. And that is very, very different. Undisturbed is undisturbed. A setback, I'm not sure what that means. Um, it generally means you can't build in it. Um, paragraph A says no disturbance until the design of the rural view shed is approved by the city arborist. So it, it appears that we're moving from an undisturbed buffer to a designed buffer. And I think we want to think very carefully because those are very opposite extremes of our two options, our, our multitude of options. And we really need to think about what's right and what we want to do. Um, what do we do about invasive plants, right? We need to address that. We need to, have, we need to think about the right thing to do. Um, we need to think about a standard where replanting is required so the arborist doesn't have to say, I think you need to replant. There needs to be a defined standard that he has to plant to. Um, so there's a lot of improvements, but there's also some things that we need to look at. One of the improvements is the requirement to install an orange tree safe fence. However, that tree safe fence is only required to protect three things. It protects the uh, specimen trees, the Olympic athletes that we have in our, in our tree stands. Um, it re protects the, what is defined as a protected tree, which is a 15 inch or larger tree. And then heritage trees, which are trees that council has identified as special and, and deserve protection. So I wanna illustrate the difference in the size of a two inch tree here Eight inch, eight inch dogwoods or flowering trees are protected. Now, I don't know if I've ever seen an eight inch dogwood in my life. 15 inch um, protected trees would be protected and 27 inch um, heritage or specimen trees. So it has to be 27 inches or larger to be considered a specimen tree. And then it has to meet some other criteria as well. So whether it was a mistake or an oversight, as drafted now, there's a big difference between here in all of these trees. So what we're saying is these and larger don't matter. If it's flowering and this size, we'll save it. If it's this size, we'll save it. And if this size is a specimen, we'll, we'll save it. Um, so I, I, I was a, a little hesitant to share my illustration, but I thought, you know, it's really kind of hard sometimes to, to get an a, a understanding of how large some, some numbers are in isolation. So um, again, let's just think carefully about the decisions we make tonight. Thanks for the time. Thank you. And Sherry, do we have any more public comments? That's awesome. Okay. On, on this item? Yes. You would turn one in. We've got one here. I'm fine if you want to call that one unless the council. Okay. Uh, my name is Julie Zoner Bailey. Good evening. I reside at 255 Hickory Flat Road. And I'd be um, remiss if I didn't say welcome back to school to all of the school kids that are in Fulton County um, and other counties. Um, I hope for those of you that have school-aged children, it was a good first day at school. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to address with you this evening some things that I share along with others concerns about regarding AG1 enhancements. First of all, I want to applaud your collective efforts to make sure that we enhance our AG1 development standards. It's a great opportunity for our community to be able to embrace the things that all of us, um, even when we're on opposite sides of a particular issue, I think we all agree that conserving and preserving is really, really important. And there's some critical areas that we don't all agree on, but I think tonight we're talking about things that hopefully we can all agree on. And it's just a function of how do we get those details into the legal requirements. Um, I may not be going step by step on each of these in terms of where they fall. Um, I just have some general comments. and I'm gonna leave it to you to decide if they're where they need to be, but they all deal with AG1 enhancement. So if I'm out of order, forgive me. Um, I, I want to echo the importance of the stronger tree save requirements. There's a few examples that were, um, gee, tough to see. Um, one in particular that um, happened as recently as last week, and I saw it again tonight, 
and it disturbs me greatly, and that's in front of Strawberry Fields. And those trees were completely leveled, and in fact, Ace, I wrote it down because I drove by it as I was on my way here, Ace Tree Service, they're there today taking out more trees. Um, it, it's like watching people whose lives have been lost, because I kind of feel about trees that way, um, and I think many of us do. But we need to get to the bottom of how that happened. I don't know if it was an individual that just went against our tree ordinance or if that was part of transportation. In pre I don't know. But I would be remiss if I didn't say tonight and today how disturbing that is. And I, nobody should have to drive by kind of the raping of our land. And that's a strong word, but that's what I feel when I drive by it. And so I don't know how that happened, but I surely hope it doesn't continue to happen. And we got to get behind that. we got to get ahead of it um, because it destroys where we live and what we love. And people I don't even know that I've never known have sent me emails and calls and said, tell me how that happens. And I don't know, but I'll, I'll be happy to help find out. So that's just one example along with Nixon and Freemanville, along with another example, Freemanville and Birmingham. We've got to get ahead of this. I know we all feel that way, but every time we lose ground, we all lose ground. I, I, I feel very strongly about it, as I know many, many citizens do. I look for your help. Thank you. Um, with regards, and I know that later tonight you have a discussion item specifically on gravel roads, but I'm talking about it here because legally I believe it is an AG1 enhancement. It was brought to the Planning Commission as an AG1 enhancement, so I am going to mention that now. I believe that three acre minimums on any land adjacent to gravel roads needs to be and remain three acre minimums. Um, that is about conserving and preserving land. It's how it needs to be interpreted, and I strongly believe that's an AG1 enhancement. Um, with regards to the undisturbed view shed, um, I echo the comments that were made by the earlier public speakers. Um, I would concur that the 40 foot needs to remain undisturbed. Again, we've got the examples that were just mentioned, many others, where the distinction between undisturbed and disturbed is huge. Um, if it needs to be disturbed, let that be through a variance process because the majority of the view sheds need to remain undisturbed. Um, with regards to AG1 developments, and we obviously know there's going to be a lot of them, um, I, and this has been mentioned um, elsewhere, and it may be that it's already underway, but it seems that a team of folks needs to be engaged in reviewing a particular development long before an LDP is issued, and that might be a compilation of internal staff, along with our city manager, along with our town architect, you know, along with all the folks that bring a particular attention to detail, and while that might initially sound daunting, it doesn't seem too daunting when it's the future of our community. It would seem that every development, AG1 or otherwise, deserves a multitude of eyes, a multitude of folks that have different experiences and different ability to give detail to the attention that it needs because we candidly are not catching all the things that we need to. Um, specifically because fortunately we had, I think it was Chapter 48 recently approved, I would ask that since that approval has taken place, that anything that's in the hopper, so to speak, get re-reviewed. Um, I think that it's important, and maybe that's already happened, I just, I'm not privy to that, but there were some enhancements to Chapter 48 with regards to our roadways that would impact developments that were already kind of in the pipeline. So as an example, Freemanville and Birmingham Road, there's some things there. Do we really need a desail lane based on the things that were changed? Do we need sidewalks that go nowhere? I don't think we do. I think our rural view shed and the rural character would say no. But some of those developments were submitted with requirements that we no longer require. So I would strongly um, request and, and plead with you to go back and make sure we have an exhaustive list of any development under any particular phase of development, even if an LDP has already been issued. If the dirt hasn't been turned, or even if it's been turned, unfortunately, against our code, we need to go back. We owe it to ourselves and our community to readdress what's, what's right and what needs to be corrected. Because we have that opportunity, you have that opportunity, and I implore you to please do that. So please go back and re-review every development that's currently in process that may not need what's currently on their plans. Because sometimes it's what we don't need, right, that ruins our rural look. Um, with regards to code enforcement, Every day, it becomes clear that we don't have sufficient code enforcement. We've got great people working for the city of Milton, but we don't have enough of the right people. Citizens shouldn't be code enforcement. We should not be the ones having to pick up the phone. We do, but we shouldn't have to be. We should not have to be the eyes and ears of this community all the time. We need more eyes and ears that are paid by the city of Milton to go out and enforce our laws, and they're not being enforced as they need to be. If we don't have code enforcement in place and if we don't take it seriously, we're not going to protect everything that we claim we love. 
If we love it, we should protect it, and that means we've got to enforce the code. We're nice people, but enforce the code. Smile when we enforce the code. Thank the person that needs the code enforced. But please enforce the code. That's why we have it. That's why we approved it starting in 2006. We're not doing a good enough job. That's just honest. I was honest with my students today when their behavior was not as it needed to be. We've got to have direct, honest conversations. We can smile and say thank you, but we need to be honest. Um, with regards to um, protection of the night sky, I talked about that with you guys before. I know we have an ordinance with regards to night sky, but I think there's some things that we can do within our AG1 development. So when a development's going in, do we really need it to be like an airport? You know, there's a difference between safety and being overlit. So please let's take um, some time and think about what more could we do? Because when we erode our night sky, the people that are moving to Milton f don't even know what a night sky was. We had one, we still have one in some parts, but we erode it every time we allow too much lighting. There's a balance, we don't need too much. Um, with regards, we've already talked about the recent examples um, where hopefully we can go back and correct some of those things. Um, one thing that would be really helpful, um, because the community does want to help, right? We want to help preserve where we live. It'd be really helpful if on the website somewhere there could be a list of AG1 developments, or any development really, that's actually maybe on the plates of staff, because we are out driving around, right, when we drive to school or drive to our businesses. So if we were aware that there was a development underway, we could be the, we don't want to be code enforcement, but we could help say, oh gosh, that's a great example of something being done right. Or gee, did you realize that we might need somebody to run over and take a look at, gee, I didn't see a land disturbance permit, but there's a lot of dirt being turned over and it seems that it might not be legal. So, you know, let the community do what it can help to do, but if we would probably need a proactive list that was posted somewhere that just allowed people to know what's underway. Um, and if we know that there's transportation projects coming, I know we do a good job of letting people know that. You know, maybe we could communicate that um, with regards to other things as well. Because I think if we communicate proactively with our citizenry, it usually um, serves us all well. Um, AG1 enhancements are so important, and I just can't thank you enough for standing tall along with those trees that came down and um, helping to improve what you guys have already been working on. Um, just thank you. This is, from my perspective, one of the most important things you can be doing. Um, the last two points I would say that I think AG1 enhancements need to prohibit um, CUPs. I don't think that CUPs in their current state enhance AG1. I think they should be prohibited. And I also think that community septic should be prohibited as it does not enhance AG1 development. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, so do that all in public comment. Okay. Um, Kathy, I don't know, where would you want to lead this now? Just discussion back and forth with the Planning Commission or? Yes, um, I, I think that um, we might have some questions with the Planning Commission or um, want to um, sort of ask them where they came from in terms of their recommendations and, and what they based on. Okay. And, and one thing, and just based on comment that I just heard, which reminds me, we've got several today, Carter and, and Steve, if you guys could do some information going out on um, what's going on in Crab Apple and with the transportation, the, G, the DOT project that where the trees are coming down, but at least to, uh, to get that out because there are a lot of folks that are wondering what, if there's something being developed there or what's going on. But sorry, just a little side note. So, um, did uh, this council have some specific questions uh, for commission? I know we. Question here, uh, maybe it's Kathy. All these uh, yellow highlighted uh, sections in here, is that what the uh, council came up with yes, last night? Yes, that's the last meeting. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, those are, uh, we, we were looking at those and they essentially related to the um, uh, exclusion of minor subdivisions and single family lots. Right. From, from the rural view, and that's uh, so I we try to capture that. Okay, is it appropriate to uh, talk about that at this time? Sure. Okay, on the handout that uh, Kathy gave us for the meeting, page three of eight, 
it addresses the rural view shed and uh, it uh, it exempts uh, minor subdivisions and uh, single family homes on, uh, on essentially uh, rural roads and after having thought about that for a while I'd like for us to consider it again. Um, I think what uh, this allows uh, or, or eliminates an architectural review of those houses in minor plants and in single family uh, residences along major roads. And if you stop and think about it, what kind of uh, All kinds of different architecture would be allowed if uh, we agreed to this uh, section of the, the code. Um, I think you're, you're op or we're opening ourselves up to um, really drastic changes in architectural design uh, along a rural view shed. You could go from, uh, uh, say, white columns or in a scary or any other uh, subdivision like that, then the uh, next uh, parcel that's undeveloped up there, you could get anything from a Frank Lloyd Wright if it were a single family residence or if it was a minor plat or any other type of uh, architecture that's uh, not uh, complementary of the rural character of, of the uh, community so I would I'd like to see us reconsider that and possibly remove that uh, that condition of uh, rural view shed and just leave it open uh, as it was before so all roads or all residences whether uh, single family or minor subdivision plats are subject to the review of the city architect I guess I'm a little confused because I thought that was more about the 40 foot setback than it was about the review by the city architect. And we never talked about it. Yeah. We didn't strike anything there, Bill, that, uh, that had anything that would have addressed the architecture. Yeah, this was, well, that was actually more about the uh, <coughs> um, setback. Setback. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to further define it such that if, if the minor it'd be, it'd be just minor subdivisions that are like parallel to the road and I think what we what we're trying to get at there was the fact that you know historically rural houses didn't have to comply with the 40-foot setback and they had yards and we've had several of them built in Milton recently that you know one right across from a, I guess Northwestern Middle School that's a you know a nice little house that it looks much better to have its nice little yard than it would to have what was there previously so but I but we don't want it to be a way for people to get around having to to you know do it but so I'd like to see it only be a subdivision with no more than three lots parallel and the three lots are parallel to the to the road well yeah. it could be parallel but not adjacent to the right of way. Kathy, we, if you go back to Bill's point, he makes a good point about trying to make sure that we preserve the look and feel of the rural architecture that's part of what makes Milton, Milton. Don't we address um, architectural review for AG1 at some point other? This, um, like I said, I don't, that was not in this. We didn't strike anything from this that would have taken that from consideration. Because I think it actually does exist somewhere else well, in our yeah. ordinance. If, if I may, if you go on to the following page, on uh, page four, under subsection four, um, and that's where we talk about structures located on our subject to a rural region, architectural elevation shall be reviewed. So that we have in the past with, with the original rural view shed, 
uh, we, we have said that not only are you required to have a rural view shed, but also that it needs architectural review, and that's because you're along an exterior road, so that was always the concern. Um, when we uh, when we last talked uh, with the council, they, they did ask us to uh, remove we, we minor subdivisions into individual lots, but the, the way we structured this is that we said that all the requirements under Rural View Shed K, Section, Section K, which includes one through seven, would, would be under that exclusion. And so I think the Karen's point is that we really just talk about it in terms of the Rural View Shed requirement, but leave in Subsection 4, which is the architectural review. So is that, that it accomplishes? Yeah. Joe? Yeah. Yeah, so along those lines, and, and I agree the the smaller three lots or less is sort of a special case, and so we could probably talk about that separately, but I'm interested in understanding the change from the, uh, the change from the um, undisturbed buffer to the setback, what the logic was there and why you think that that's a better idea, what issue is it really addressing? Um, I think, I think we would, I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I think we'd be okay with keeping it as undisturbed. I think what we had the issue with is when we were talking with staff over the months is, you know, what's considered undisturbed, right? Because as you can see, we, we have an undisturbed buffer on the books now. Right. And it's right. getting disturbed. So we were like, all right, how do we fix that and <laughs> yeah, so agree more. is it a primary setback does that fix it or do we keep it at undisturbed and actually have a definition for undisturbed even though the definition it should speak for itself yeah. so we i think we're on the same page as far as that and i think what uh staff was getting at is they want the, the they want the flexibility to where if you want to do the grove and you know, they want to make it enhance the grove we should be able to do that. However, um, everyone's view is different on what is enhancing and what's not. So I think we're fine either way, and we would rather, or at least my opinion, would rather be un, an undisturbed buffer. Right. That's what we currently have in the book, so I don't know. Yeah, and I, I, in going over this, it, it seemed, we seemed to be in conflict. I know what we were trying to do was the right thing, and, and uh, to your point, we have this undisturbed buffer today, yet it gets disturbed all the time. It, either it's getting disturbed through a variance, which probably is a small set of the cases, right. or it's getting disturbed without our approval. It's right. getting disturbed. Can and I, I jump and in I'm there? I'm afraid that that happens. The issue with the undisturbed buffer, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the undisturbed buffer is really only defined currently where you have changes in zoning, um, specifically where you have a change from like residential to commercial. So the undisturbed, the undisturbed buffer was designed to buffer commercial developments from other types of developments. It's not defined as it pertains to residential development, which is so, a lot of the issue that we're trying to fix right now. And, so and the, that's uh, why it's really? getting disturbed. So you're saying that when it's residential property that's being developed, the undisturbed buffer goes away? There is no definition of undisturbed buffer in resi within, in, within AG1, within residential development. Okay. Kathy, maybe correct me. Last July, or maybe it's two Julys ago, we did the text amendments. Yeah, maybe it's two years ago. We did the text amendments that added the 40 foot undisturbed buffer. I mean, because it used to be there was zero undisturbed buffer, correct? Correct. Then we added the language of 40 and 20. Correct. Yes. And what we're getting caught up in is. There is all, but we never defined it. And so, and when we went back to, to look at definitions, right. version two, which is what is before us, we, we realized that the word buffer is already, as Steve mentions, is, is, is part of our zoning definition for buffer. And buffer, the term buffer is used to um, uh, buffer or you know, to shade or whatever, screen, or screen um, develop, residential against commercial developments. That's a zoning buffer as we know it in the definition here. We're talking about a rural view shed across exterior roads. So how do, what do we call that? How do we refer okay. to it? So all right, all right. Complicated. I, I, I think last meeting that we talked about this, it, 
you guys used the language that we're changing the undisturbed buffer to a setback. That's and right. so that's why I clung to the idea that the current language addresses it as an undisturbed buffer. But if you're telling me now that the undisturbed buffer actually isn't applicable for residential, then what I would suggest is that we change the setback to an undisturbed buffer and we put the undisturbed buffer in the language with exactly what it means. It's an undisturbed buffer. And the reason I'm, I'm there, the reason I want to go there is because to me, we've been talking about saving the rural view shed that exists today. We're not talking about creating a rural view shed that doesn't exist and we're imagining it. We want to imagine something new and therefore we want to engineer something new. I think what we have today, and one of our citizens gave us some great pictures of exactly what exists today, what we have today is, is, is good. I mean, it's awesome. And it's a lot of reason that people move up here. So protecting that by making it undisturbed, and I don't know if we want to use the term buffer or whatever we want to use, it should, the rule should be leave what we have alone. And if what we have isn't acceptable or if it's problematic for any reason, we come, they, they have to approach us with a variance and they have to ask us for permission to do something different. As opposed to saying, you guys can do something different from the outset. Let's just hope it's something really good and the city arborist will make that determination. Not that he can't do that. I believe that he can. But my point is, I would rather have this as an exception as opposed to the rule. But I think to that point, I think what we, we've got to do, we've got to have some mechanism where it's not, you know, an exact. Because I agree. You look at these pictures and, and everything. That's what people want to preserve. And if, you know, I think in everybody's intent, I know mine would be if someone's putting a new, new development in or a subdivision or whatever, you want to keep that buffer, you want to keep the existing, and that's what we're picturing so that you don't see a lot. But we also have to have some flexibility or ability. We've had cases where somebody is building a home and a horse barn and horse pastures on five or 10 acres, and there's nothing but some scrub right in the front of it, a beautiful pasture and fence, but you know, you can't see it. Well, that may be a case where the city is okay and the citizens are okay. You want to see that. That's what we're looking for. So yeah. we have to have some flexibility there or, or an avenue that somebody, and, and to your point, you know, they may have to come from a variance and say, we're going to take some scrubby bushes down and whatnot, but because we've got, you know, five acres of pasture and, uh, you know, we would put the blackboard fence in there. But Yeah, I think what happened was we, you know, in the confines of these chambers, we, did, we discussed it at length and recognize that we had a shortcoming with what was out there and, and actually happening today. So we, with the seven, you know, the seven minds and the benefit of staff as well, put together what we thought was something bulletproof. And as soon as you finish it, guess what? It's not. Yeah. yeah so sure. we, had, we heard some great suggestions from the community tonight, all of which I think are, are, have significant merit. To suggest that it goes back to undisturbed is terrific. Um, and I think to suggest that it has, and I think we heard another another suggestion tonight that there is a, a layered on level of buffering if there was going to be something disturbed. But I think even before you go to that point, we may even be better served to say simply undisturbed. Then to your point, Joe, if there's going to be a reason, a valid reason for a disturbance, it has to come before measure by planning commission and council for a variance. And then based on what's presented, it's then determined by those deciding bodies that it does or doesn't meet an adjusted standard. If it's not significantly enhanced beyond what's there today, you simply say no, but the undisturbed buffer is what we prefer to see. And you've accomplished both uh, objectives, I think. I think we've uh, started to take steps in that uh, direction to preserve uh, these natural buffers along some of the roads by eliminating uh, decel lanes wherever wherever possible. I think some of the most egregious uh, examples of where these uh, decel lanes have uh, uh, taken up these natural buffers are over New Providence Road, uh, more than one subdivision over there. So. Uh, I think through that process, eliminating decel lanes is a big step forward in uh, trying to preserve those undisturbed. I think both XL and decel lanes. 
uh, don't need Excel lanes anymore. Okay. They're not required now. Yeah. Oh, left turn lanes. Yeah. Karen? I, I agree that our default ought to be to keep things as natural as possible. And if what is there is not what we want, then we ought to have strict guidelines for the people to change it. I don't know whether or not variance is the right way to go, because under our current code, a variance requires a hardship and you know, several other things, and it doesn't go before the Planning Commission and Council, it goes before the BZA. If we want to call it's something else so that it would come before the planning commission and the council some other means to make a change if what is if what is naturally there is not what is appropriate if it's you know because the corner and we think something else would look much better there they ought to have a, a way to do that um, but if it's going to come before the planning commission and council then it's got to be something other than your standard variance which goes before the bca well, I think the point it, it you, and, and probably a very small percentage of applications are going to have this issue. Um, so we could either define, you know, either totally undisturbed or this, this, or this, or have a process where somebody comes. And again, it's not a, you know, not necessarily a hardship like you need to go to the BZA, but it's it's an improvement both for the individual that owns the property as well as the the eyesight of the citizens that live here. And, and again, I use the example of you know and maybe it's as simple as saying it's undisturbed unless you got a you know you're putting in a pasture and there's nothing specimen or whatever it's just you know scrubby trees and, and brush and the structures are x number of feet way back you know setbacks and blah 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 but again it may be better to have on a case-by-case -case example so that you know people can look at it but you know basically the only way you're going to get around the undisturbed buffer is if it's an improvement i.e. something better to look at or a, a better buffer. Yeah, I'd go along with that, Joe. Um, and maybe deferred to uh, Ken as far as uh, an undisturbed buffer. Uh, we've been talking about definition of undisturbed buffer here for the last several years. Uh, could we? Uh, identify it as something as, as vague, but it's to be determined at the time that uh, a land disturbance permit is applied for, and let staff identify what is to remain undisturbed and what is to be improved upon or engineered, as Joe says. That's a little my typical position with respect to that is, is when I think back about how zoning codes and land development regulations are typically interpreted by courts, they typically, if there's ambiguity or a gray area, they're typically interpreted in favor of the free use of property. So if you were to ask me, you know, what's my preference? My preference would be to lock it down more as opposed to less. And so to the extent that, that we want to give staff some discretion, I think that's fine. But at a minimum, I would say we need to set a minimum threshold criteria and then let staff <coughs> interpret it over and above that minimum threshold criteria. Does that make sense to what I'm, and I think that may be of what you were proposing, but I just wanted to say, I, by, by all means, we need to impose a minimum requirement. And that is kind of your, what you were suggesting. At first, do no harm. And then if the standard is that the, that the, what exists on the ground is believed, you know, it, 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 you know meets your rural view shed requirements, then, then that's fine. But if in fact some sort of accentuation, some additional plantings or whatever are needed, then that could be the area of discretion. But the baseline is it has to be X. And I like that too with, because again, like I said before, it may be either, you know, you allow it to be disturbed because there's a better view on the other side of it, or you can improve on the on the buffer. And, you know, good example, you know, Karen, you mentioned kudzu, or if there's a, you know, really bad scrub brush area, and um, it's allowed to be disturbed, but then they have to go back and plant, you know, a better buffer. Um, Are we better off calling this like a, a undisturbed rural view shed buffer, undisturbed rural view shed setback? so that it doesn't get mixed in with our, our normal undisturbed buffer to make yes. sure we know that this is something different. Yes, okay. yes. I mean, hearing Ms. Fields talk about the fact that we've already got some, some possibly 
uh, difficult to, to interpret buffer language in the code. Let's call this something altogether different so there's no possibility of ambiguity. I agree. Sure. So, so, Kathy, in terms of, because we're opening the door now to the idea that something else can be done. In other words, if the view should that exists today isn't necessarily what the community or somebody thinks that they want, and so we want to put something else there. Now all of a sudden we're opening the door for how do we uh, judge or interpret uh, a proposal, okay? And so I, I was wondering, um, is this something that you think to support the city arborist? Let me, let me state it a different way maybe. I'm very concerned that we're putting all the weight of making this decision on one person. Okay, what I would rather see is for one person potentially to lead a review and make a decision, but do it with support by a lot of other people. And when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about the design review board and what role they could potentially play in this, because this is something that they do on a regular basis for other things. So I wanted to get your take on how we might craft that so that we've got um, community input because this is going to be one of those sensitive things where everybody's going to want to have their say and the minute you do that it sort of elevates the whole decision up to another level so I just want to get your take on that. I, well I, I think that's not a bad idea frankly um, and that our solution would be because when we look at each rural review shed you know you can end up with a rural review shed that has a lot of scrub and so our thought was to disturb it and enhance it with some more plantings to you know and then the opposite is when you have, as the mayor said, you've got someone who wants to put a, uh, a, a, a horse pasture and wants to delete those scrub pines because of the horse pasture. So it comes down to a case by case. And, that, and that's where we sort of ended up. Is, so how do we best address the case by case to protect the community's vision and, um, and then working with the developer to make sure that that happens? And so our solution was to use the city harbors but um, I think the important takeaway is that it, 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 many times it, it may be a case by case. If, if the natural understood do no harm, um, it, it is not relevant. So uh, whether it's the city arbors or the design review board, um, for those cases that are different than the do no harm scenario, um, uh, you know, I think certainly we, we could uh, you know, find that acceptable. We had just used the staff person, but it did the, the board work as well. So as long as we have that ability, because I really think that you would want that flexibility as, as you go along. Yeah, so let me let me make a comment too on that to that point. I, and I think we need to be careful. Maybe it's a stage thing because all these things we are talking about should be benefits to to the property owners, the community, everybody. These should all be good things. The reason you would allow an undisturbed buffer to be disturbed is to improve the landscape or to improve the view or whatever and I think we need to be careful and maybe we have a step maybe there's some things that are real obvious and real easy to make the decision that staff could and then it may elevate to the next one where it needs a bigger committee and the worst case elevate to it where it comes before the public in a hearing and whatnot because if we're not careful we may lose out on some opportunities because some people may just say, well, you know what, forget it. I'm not going through a whole hearing. I'm not applying for all this. I'm not spending months and months. We'll just let it be, you know, less desirable. So, you know, I think we need to, you know, there's probably some things that are very elementary that are obvious that, you know, a small committee or staff could say, yes, obviously you can you can improve on this. But then if it gets to a certain level or, you know, but that's, that's my, I just want us to be careful that we don't make such a big deal out of it that people just say, well, never mind, we're not going to go through that. Go. Go. Um, I tend to approach things scientifically, I guess. And I know we have proved here recently for Carter contract to do pavement uh, evaluation with a traveling a vehicle with cameras on it, photographing pavement, determining the uh, serviceability of the, the roads and what all. Uh, we have about, what, between 190 and 200 miles of road in the city? 172. 172. Oh, we've lost some. 
Who <laughs> wrote it? Uh, I, I got it. I got it. <laughs> uh, how difficult would it be to determine, uh, well, we could determine it, I guess, the, the amount of land that's already been developed that's uh, out there uh, and the amount of land that's to be developed and as Joe says, what our, our uh, perception or I, our, our idea of the rural viewshed is what we have today or what's left today. Why not go photograph what's out there? Instead of leaving it to conjecture and personal uh, uh, evaluation, is, uh, is this what we had originally? Is this you shed that uh, we want to preserve out here to photograph it. And whatever uh, development comes in for permit, well, here's what it is or what it was on the 8th of August 2016, and uh, this is what we wanted to preserve. So, just a thought. Uh, but the permit Google Maps has already done that Google, for yeah, us. Exactly. So, we've, we've got. Recent aerial photography from the county maintains a historical flash aerial photography, but we've got 2016 aerial photography. And as Councilman Loss mentioned, uh, the photographic work they do for the pavement analysis, they also do a pavement, uh, or they, they do a right of way photograph as they go down, too. So, uh, what we did in 2012 and what we do now, we have photographs every That gives you basically a view down the right of way, the aerial photography that gives you a view, plan view, uh, what extent to tell me on. Let's use the tools that we already have. Yeah, so it is documented. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. I just think it, well, Bill makes a good point. When we talk, just looking at paper, we're trying to make decisions with words and whatever, yet when you look at something, you've got a certain feeling, and you say, okay, that's what it looks like, yeah, that's what I like. If we can capture that, then I think you're also going to help uh, community development. If we've got the record already, we, so when someone comes in and we know the parcels and we can look and say, okay, what is there today? So I think you need to start with what we've got today before you can decide, does it need to be you know, improved upon or whatever? So I, agree it, with I think that's fairly obvious because whatever someone brings forward, obviously there's going to be the existing and we'll have a document, you know, but again, whatever someone's bringing forward, it's existing there and you, you can, can measure it from that. I mean, I think the good news is what we're talking about, and I believe everybody's on the same page, is we're only talking about it, we're only talking about either saving and preserving what's there or improving on it. So, you know, it's should be a good thing. But, uh, can I jump in there? Yeah. The, uh, it, I think the where some of the problem is also with, the, with, with some of the uh, interpretations from the community is what is improvement? Um, a, a recent uh, example would be what's going was is the development up at Freemanville and Nix. Uh, a lot of what re was removed there was invasive species and scrub. Um, I think a lot of people would don't want that touched. Now, if it's good, currently as staff would interpret it, they would look at that and say, okay, we've got a bunch of kudzu there. Do you want to see kudzu or do you want to see what you know what's on page three of what was handed out? If that's the case, the it, you're going to see exactly what happened um, all along Freemanville Road right now because that's going to be removed and I hopefully something as nice as what's on page three would, uh, would, would replace that. But I, I think we need to come to a determination. Do we want to just leave, do you want staff to make those determinations or do you want to just leave that, that buffer as is, whatever it is? Um, uh, because we're, as staff, as we look at it right now, I, I don't mean to put words in anybody's mouth here, but I have a feeling you're going to see page three and not what was, what was originally there on, uh, on, on Freemanville. And I just want to be careful because sometimes when you make absolutes and you have absolute rules, you know, it doesn't work in every situation. Sure. So, uh, you know, my position is I would rather see it improved. Um, so I don't, I don't know how everybody else feels, but I think we need to clarify that and, and have uh, at least the vehicle to do that if, you know, if everybody's on board with that. I think people might feel better about what was happening at Nixon Freemanville if they knew what was coming to, to backfill what happened. Yeah. All they're seeing right now is red clay. And, and, that's, 
And you know, that's a good point. And unfortunately, you know, I made it a, a point today when I'm driving around. And I'm driving and I see some established neighborhoods. And a lot of times you, you hear people say, well, look at new development versus 20-year-old. You know, they didn't do it like, they didn't clear cut like they're clear cut now. Mm -hmm. But if you really look at it close, you can picture, okay, that was cut. These trees were planted 10 years ago, 15 years ago, these bushes, whatnot. And so sometimes it does take a little time to heal. And a good example is New Providence Road where, where the development came in and they had to clear extra wide area to put the trail in, take trees down and all that. It looked terrible when you drove by it. But if you drive by it now and you see the grass and the trail meandering through there, people would say, wow, that looks really good. But it's, it is a, a snapshot in time when they come in and see, you know, see the, the, the brown dirt versus something green. Now, granted, you know, trees down is, is, a, is a big issue, but, you know, just dirt versus, you know. Uh, and some of the green. some of the entrance things that we've um, known to be of the Milton today is also going to be changed with some of the things that are being proposed by the Planning Commission for you guys to consider. And that is that the grand entrances are proposed to be a thing of the past. It's going to be more um, six hills like in our proposed uh, language for you guys to consider than it is even the white columns entrance that I live in. Um, so I think we're moving in that direction and the objective is to not have the scraping and the clearing of any of that stuff. So we're, if you choose to adopt what we're proposing, we, we have taken some of those steps. What uh, can you help us, Kathy, to staff with direction and, you know, you guys are what I guess what I'm hearing is uh, the, uh, the idea that a case-by-case case may not be so bad because there are extenuating <coughs> circumstances, but do you want to elevate it to a DRB which meets once a month, which could um, add some, some extra time and, and, and effort to a potential developer? Um, what I can say is that when we do our permit codes, we do have what we call an administrative variance, and that's something that I do um, with um, uh, uh, discussion with other members of my staff to de determine whether or not um, something could achieve a variance as per what the code allows. So um, rather than having the city arbors be the lone arbiter to determine whether or not something that the community development director could do through an administrative variance. It wouldn't be a variance that you know it through the BCA. It's not going to be just a couple of other names, but um, it, it, it would be a way then to have other people touch it um, as well. You, you know, if we could come up with different levels, you know, I know it's maybe hard to, to put on paper, but I mean, there are some things that I'd be willing to bet 99% of people would agree 100, or, you know, all the time on 99 because there's always one person that would disagree. But you know, things that are very obvious, and and maybe to your point, and when you mention a developer and a development, to me, if it's a subdivision going in or whatever, and they're having to submit plans and whatnot, and that's the case, they're going through a big process. That may be fine to go through the variance process or, or go to the DRB or whatever as part of it. You know, to me, the concern is if you got a you know, somebody that bought a five acre parcel or a three acre parcel and they're just doing something that we, you know, rural, that looks rural, we want to have, you know, is that something where it could be as simple as going in and meeting with the arborist and saying, okay, you know, this kudzu and these scrubs can go if you plant this or if you, you know, put pasture in and a blackboard fence, something like that. That's my concern is, you know, the small property owner or somebody that's doing something that uh, is equestrian or agricultural, you know, that would, would make them not want to do it if it was too much red tape, so to speak. But now when you get to it, you know, if it's a development going in and they're submitting plans and doing lots and whatnot, I personally don't feel, a need, you know, I don't mind them having to go through a harder step to, if so, in a case by case. Well, well, or maybe we go back to a, you know, a, what do you call it, a, a minor plat or a three acre, well, a three. Minor doesn't uh, have to have it anyway, though, does it? Well, well it's like these serve. changes that we have, Right now, um, we added a step for any three lots or more has to have 
a CZIM type meeting, correct? Yes. That's so, the public so I mean, that's part of the new change. Mm -hmm. So, I guess just thinking out loud, uh, that CZI or that public info meeting could be with the DRB to talk. To right. So yeah, I mean, maybe it's addressed that way. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, you kind of have it in there that maybe y'all could just add some language. Okay. And um, for the record, City Councilmember Hewitt's here. But for the record, he did not get the memo from Councilmember Lester Moore. <laughs> Red chair minute to get no. <laughs> I'm my own person. Um, well, so, so right now, the way you've structured it is that um, um, the minor plats and individual lots are exempt from the rule of shed requirement. So they wouldn't have any design process. So, so they would be out to start with. Um, so if that's sufficient, fine. I don't know about, the, yeah, but if it's, you know, and maybe we firm this up, but if it's a quote no brainer, if somebody submitted something and, you know, it's a no brainer that's an improvement on the, the view shed, you know, I don't know what the best way to have staff or, you know, to different levels, again, to whether it needs to come, come before us or, as Peyton said, to, you know, CZIM process or just part of the process. Here. To me, if you can get the community development director, the town architect, and the arbors to all agree that it's an administrative minor improve, the improvement, then they probably ought to just get the improvement. But if, if not, all three of them don't agree on the improvement, and, and, and to me, that's, they have to actually see what the improvement's going to be. So it's not just, well, you know, sure. we're going to improve. Then it needs to go to the DRB. I, I mean, I would agree with that because I think if you have to go – three level of staff and you guys know what us in the community are looking for um, you know to points earlier we just need yeah. to make sure we're on top I mean, of that. If all three of them agree that you know the cuts of the field needs to be improved on then, you know, then I, I think that's pretty much a no-brainer but you know if they all three don't agree then it just needs to go to the DRB with the recommendation. If it's not clear cut. Uh, I'm, pardon my term. <laughs> clear cut. I don't mean, the decision is not clear. <laughs> Okay. Anybody or else? even if, so, the, if it's you're not clear as to what the replacement is, it still needs to go to the DRB. It's only administrative if y'all all agree that it needs to be improved and what that improvement right. is. We have a clear plan that we all agree. And that it's definitely an improvement. You know, I guess the litmus test would be an improvement that the community would support, council would support, and you know, hopefully the landowner support too. I have one other thing in here. On page four, under number three, it says criteria that may may to be used, and I don't know if it's criteria that may be used or criteria to be used. And to me, those are different because may is can or cannot, where to be is is. Yeah, that's a that's that's very ambiguous, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I just wasn't sure what the intent was. If it was. Maybe I think there's a, 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 I think there's extra word in there. Yeah. yeah, there's just one. Which one? I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Is which one is it? Uh, whichever one you prefer. Well, I would say two B. I think you're right. I get rid of the May. Two B is two B. It's the same. Okay. We intended to say Mike could be fixed now. Going back on the previous uh, point, uh, maybe ask Ken. Uh, Karen suggests. To uh, have the buffer reviewed by three or four members of staff, yep. do you think that's specific enough, or is it still vague? It's going to be it's going to be a matter of how it's written. I'll have to work with Ms. Field on looking at the actual language that they bring back to you. We got to, you know, one of the curious things anymore is we got to be careful about creating an ad hoc committee uh, that's basically voting on this as well. So we'll have to look at that issue. Uh, as well to make sure we don't have to have them assemble by way of an agenda and notice every time they meet to pass upon this thing. So we'll just have to be clear that they're acting independently. The expectation, as I heard it, would be that they would all have to basically sign off on some form of a, either it looks good, keep it as it is, or some sort of an enhancement. We'll have to build in an appellate right, obviously, because there's going to have to be some check on what they have the ability to require from these individuals. So. Councilor Lust, to your point, all, all good questions. I'll, I'll work with Kathy on trying to get some language that I can bring back to you that I'm comfortable with. Thank you. And I have a question on kind of on that point, Ken, on section 64-418. Uh, 
um, we've got a whole notification process for everybody that's in the area with regards to every parcel. And while I applaud the idea that we are announcing exactly what's going on, there's really no teeth into that process because we people be notified of what's coming, but there's nothing that can be changed by that process or or however because it's still by right with AG one. Is that correct or am I wrong with that? No, I think that's I think that's right. I seem to recall it's been a while ago that we discussed that. The notion of providing notice sometimes carries with it the expectation that if I get notice, therefore I get to effectuate right. the result and that can be frustrating to people that basically find out that no, you were you were you were notified just to know that this is coming and there's not really another shoe to drop. Um, however, you know, as with many things, sometimes when you're debating whether to provide notice or, or, or not provide notice, I think the council sort of contended itself that it was better yeah. just to let folks know. And even if there's no, you know, ability to affect change, because it is still as of right, Council Coons. Sure. It's how you word that notice. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. Yeah. 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 Please be advised. Courtesy. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> I mean, courtesy yeah. notice. Yeah, just like the, the trees over there at uh, Strawberry Field. I mean, right. if, uh, some of that word could get out what it really was, then I think uh, even if somebody didn't like it, then they would understand it. So. Right. Okay, Rick? But, and part of the discussion I like, too, is what Joe had said. That if if it, you don't come to agreement, um, you know, DRB today looks at kind of look and feel and architecture. They could be maybe a part of that process from a review process. And then part of your review, if it was three members or whatever, you would be looking at those photos or whatever so you'd actually see what, what are we starting with when you're considering. Okay. Anything else? No. Kathy? Right. Would you like us to work on bringing this back to you? Yeah, I would. I would say time is of the essence. So, does everybody else agree with that? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah as soon as you can. Okay. City, you can call the next time. Thanks. So I have this discussion of RZ fifteen nineteen to amend the R one single family residential district chapter sixty four article six division three. Yes, um, all these are the same changes. Do we have any specific public comment on this? Okay. Um, okay, I'll open up for discussion. And more on that. Okay. So we'll move on to the next item, Susan. Next item is discussion of RZ 1520 to amend the R2. Single family residential district, chapter 64, article 6, division 4. Okay. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the this is the change to the rural view shed where we're taking out the discussion on the on the undisturbed buffers, which was version one way back, and we're putting now revised version into individual uh, zoning districts. So it's a cleanup that will need to happen. And then in addition, while we had opened it up, we um, changed the stormwater language so as to um, uh, prohibit structural stormwater facilities. And um, and then the, there was one more change on um, page two is related to retaining walls, where we uh, added language to say that retaining walls are about three foot high so have a continuous plenty of evergreens, or as approved by the city arborist. And that was language that came on our last so, so those are the uh, uh, highlights of the changes to the rural view shed that we have. Okay. Any questions on that? No. Okay. So we will go to our next. Next one is discussion of RC fifteen twenty one to amend the R two A single family residential district chapter sixty four, Article six, Division five. Anything, Kathy? Public comments. No, so, 
Julie's Honor Bailey, 255 Hickory Flat Road. Because so many of these relate to the same, I, this is, I guess, a point um, for you to consider after hearing your discussion about what size lots the rule view shed would apply to. And I think Council Member Lusk um, started to go down this path, and I, I thought it was a really good conversation. I'm just not sure that I heard the summation. I think what I heard was a question about should the rule view shed apply to all pieces of land because every parcel, even if it's not a minor plat, if it's not a subdivision, you could have somebody acquiring a 10 acre parcel and if they didn't have a process to go through, we as a community might still end up with an eroded view shed. So I thought it was a really valid point. I think the discussion ended up going in the direction of do those get an architectural review, but I'd love to hear you guys maybe bring conclusion, guys and gals, conclusion to that discussion of should the rule of view should apply to all, all parcels that are parallel, or maybe not just parallel, right, but all parcels. And I know you had some thoughts as to why you moved that and applied it to just three um, lot subdivisions, but it seems to me we run the risk if we don't apply it to all that we still erode our rule of view shed. So I just thought that was a good discussion. I don't know that I heard conclusion, and would just encourage you to maybe talk about that before we assume that the rule view shed isn't applicable maybe for all parcels. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I would bring up, we, we would have the architectural review, which, um, let me see, Bob here, but Kathy, but that would, that would, um, he would look at, the, the city architect would look at view shed issues and whatnot, correct? With In that. terms of the structures um, on exterior streets, We'll make sure, even though the way the language is written, is that the, the rural view shed requirements, the setback requirements, would be exempt for three lots or less. But we will write it in a way that says the there's still architectural review for any structures that um, front or, or uh, touch. Like but I, I guess, uh, but I guess the, the intent though is uh, to make sure that basically the same. Standards apply. Um, you know, if, if they had a situation, and I can't think of too many, but that were grossly, you know, different than what the view shed that the city is looking for. Um, I wonder if we could address that then. Does that make sense at all? In terms of the architectural review, or in terms of just a, you know, with the arborist or whatever, you know, I'm trying to. Like if they had a forest in front of the structure and, and they wanted to clear cut it. But, but if, somebody, had some had a, if somebody had a whole bunch of scrubbing blackberry bushes and they're, and they're building a house on one acre that fronts the street, you gotta let them clear that out so they have a nice yard rather than just a bunch of the blackberry bushes. You like think is, well, yeah, but, but, but I think that's why we, you know, so yeah, I think if you can just write it so that as part of the architectural review, it looks not looks at not only the structure itself, but the placement on the lot. And, and yeah, yeah, I think yeah, that's but, the point I was trying to yeah. make that they'll catch, you know, if there's, they can catch that in there that, uh, you know, if it's, if it's legitimately right. should be improved, it will be improved or they're allowed to improve it. And if it shouldn't be touched, then it's not right. touched. Can I ask you a question, Mike? Currently, as part of that review, Kathy, we're they're not we're not looking at. Correct me if I'm wrong. We're not looking at the vegetation along the roadway. Not small. Well, right now, the, 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 the current um, rural view shed requirements we have in place include all lots, single family up, and that includes looking at the rural view shed and also doing an architectural review. That's what so as a result of the, the enhancements that, that are being recommended, it's, it's being recommended that minor plots, plots will no longer be. So now as a result, if we, if we move forward with this wording, will those single, will those one, two, and three plot developments, will they be subject to, under that architectural review, will they be looking at the rule of view shed? 
The rural viewshed is being excluded from consideration. I just want to make sure we're having a meeting of the minds However, here. The architectural review, we will make sure it still remains intact. And what will be part of that architectural review? Will will any of the rural viewshed be will that will that fall under the architectural review on the on the, the one, two, and three lot development? Not as, as we define it. As so we're not we so we're not connecting here. No, no we're not. But we won't call it the rural view shed in that case. What you're talking about is the frontage on the road. Right, yes. How, how about how, how about this though? Even if it's not technically under the rural view shed, that would be one of your criteria that you're looking at. What is the view shed? Are they improving the view shed or are they trying to make it worse? If it's worse, you guys have some some ability to yeah you. The, the, those properties may be exempt, but part of your process includes looking at just like we would on anything else. Right, yeah. So we'll have to change that under yes. under the minor plats. Is there anybody? That review would be required requirements, not recommendations, on what to do if you see that it needed to be not not touched or enhanced. Whatever the staff says would go. They would have to, the the person would have to do. It will be under the architectural review process that we won't have to that. So, would that fall <coughs> under the same uh, <coughs> subcommittee of uh, staff? I don't think so. I, I don't think so. And again, <coughs> I would want to see some teeth put to that. I mean, that needs to actually make its way into the code. You know, we talk a lot of in Milton about what is the intent uh, of the code, what is the intent of this. And so we need to, we need to. To, to blend that into this architectural review so it's not just amorphous. It actually, we have to resort to the intent of the rural view shed. So something like, even though not applicable, the architectural review shall embrace and implement standards that are part of the rural view shed <coughs> and they will be you know, brought to bear administratively by a permitting. They'll have to be brought to bear. So we'll have to draft some language that makes that happen. Okay. So on the number four, we would change it instead of saying just for structures located on lots subject to a rural view shed, architectural elevations shall be reviewed and approved by the city architect. It would say uh, um, architectural elevations and a landscape plan would have to be reviewed. Yeah. 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 Mr. Mayor, why are, we, why are we parsing words on this? Why don't we just say everything needs to be reviewed? I mean, why is why is a minor right. plaque? Right? Well, I think that, I think that's what we're we're talking yeah. about now. Yeah, and I, uh, I mean, you know, I'm hearing that we're by still default we're coming back around to that. We're still sort of looking for ways to make an exception. Where I I think we we've, we've been given good reason to rethink the language that we brought forward to you to go back to ground zero and say everything everything needs to be reviewed. No disturbing of the buffer. Period. Until such time that it's been reviewed, whether it's one acre, one lot, minor plat. Or anything above that. I have a question, Mr. Record. Yeah, go ahead. Kathy, is the is the limitation though the the, the, the three lots or the or the, the limitations, the minor plot limitations, is that is there an administrative technicality and resource based reason that, that it's we're not just simply saying just do it for everybody? I mean is there is there some workflow issue that's limiting that or is no, no, no. no I, I think it was it was just a concern when you're dealing with individual lots or three or less too much to ask for a rural view shed or not. I think that's, I put it the, to the, the concern I had was, you know, and we've had these discussions before. You'll have somebody that comes in and I'll make up an example, but might have 10 acres and says, you know what, we're going to do a family compound of three homes. And we just want to leave it natural and do this and that and, and, and minimum cost. But then we have rules that say, well, you've got to have a fire line and you've got to put curb and gutter and you've got to do this. All of a sudden, they go, and you got to have buffers, and you got to plantings, and all. They go, well, gosh, we can't afford to do that. We're going to have to put eight houses in there to absorb the cost of doing that. So, that was the original intent I had was if it's a small, you know, up to three lots, it's not going to be a development. It's usually an individual, and you know, to kind of help make sure that we didn't run run those folks off, so to yeah. speak. But that was the original intent, yeah. and that, that's what I thought we had talked about. And, and, and I think to Kathy's it. point. And, and Paul, you know, respectfully, if when you guys are looking at the small three lot or less developments or property owners, and you're using the same criteria, you know, that we are uh, on the larger ones, I think we could achieve the same thing, but it just may be a simpler process. 
if that makes any sense. Yeah, but just, I think I Ken's just, point, you just kind of want to have some uh, process and write on. I would just argue that if you take any one of these pictures that were presented to us by the community this evening and you lined up three lots and said that they were not subject to the same standards and we're asking the larger ones to be subject to, you could wipe out a pretty significant view shed with three lots lined up in any one of these pictures. So I, I would strongly encourage that when we look at that language that we contemplate every single one in, with no exception. Could you somehow make it that, you know, if, if there are three lots and they all access the, the main road directly versus, you know, what your son, I think, kind of saying is, is you have a, a larger 10 acre parcel and there's one driveway that goes in, not a, not a real road, but one driveway and you have three houses tucked back in there. But if it's three houses at front, you know, that, that front on road X. Then that's another, I think you just that's need to big, leave it. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the clue. Talking good. about intent and everything, I mean, that makes it easy Let's and be frank. clean and clear. What's the message that the community has been sending us for a couple of years at this point? Stop changing the complexion of our view shed. So let's quit looking for ways to make exceptions to our view shed. Okay, but you just, uh, to my point earlier, sometimes you make an absolute rule. Yeah. And it turns well, around and, you but know, then, but then you, there you, is may, a, you may not make exceptions. It's on the books right now. But then now, all of a sudden it's a new subdivision with 20 homes or whatever versus, But there's know, a process. Rural, and we're suggesting that there's still a the process. Rate. But it starts, I think it should start. I would suggest that the process maybe is a little simpler on a small, yeah. you know, same I criteria, agree. but not as involved. But that's... You know, again, I, I don't necessarily have a, you know, if, if the council and everybody wants to do it where it's absolute and then, you know, smaller parts have to come in and get an exception that makes sense and, and everybody's, you know, that's a product that works too, right? I think the concern that we had is we didn't want to, if I've got a, a single homeowner with one acre that he's going to develop and it's along the roadway, to say, okay, you have to leave your 60 feet in the front undisturbed, whereas what might be appropriate is you may leave your big trees but you may have a lawn there instead of an undisturbed buffer so as far as a review i'm okay with looking at a review just like we want to capture everything today so we see what it is but then depending on what is going on that property if it's a 20 20 home subdivision it's going to be a greater impact than no you're going to be subject to this but if it's a single home or two homes i think put yourself in the the, the place of the landowner would you want someone, if you've got scrub and stuff along the front, so you can't touch this for 60 feet, or should it require a view to say, is this in character with what we're trying to develop? I thought that's what we talked about, is when you talk about instead of bigger subdivisions, but you talk about individual homes. We don't, frankly, see a lot of individual <coughs> homes being built along the roadway, alone, but we have seen some recently where they look really nice with the trees and grass, and that's it looks better rule. than an that's undisturbed. Well, back to a rule. Well, maybe we should see what this process is instead of just, you know, kind of yeah, guessing I think, about I think it, you talking were, about it. Let's see it in writing yeah. when, we, when it comes back around, and then we can make a decision. Get us bigger. Yeah, we can find that up. Look at your, <laughs> what you guys come up with. Does that make sense? You guys good with that? Yeah. Okay. All right, City, where we are. Which Number six, right. discussion of RZ 1523 to amend the CUP, Community Unit Plan District, Chapter 64, Article 6, Division 23. Do you have any uh, comment? Okay. Kathy? Okay. Okay. And discussion, questions, comments? Okay. Next item is discussion of RZ 1524 to amend the rural Milton overlay for single family type uses, section 641141. And Mr. I apologize, my explanation about amending the rural overlay coming up that line was really narrow. So it's really applied to the 24. Okay. I see no comments. Okay. <laughs> All right, any questions on this or discussions? Okay. Maybe. Did you guys feel you got some direction? Okay. Mayor, Mayor. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, can we uh, discuss, <coughs> discuss this in enforcement? Absolutely. That's what the board said, yeah. I mean, 
we just don't seem to be able to enforce what we're doing. I mean, the public has spoken. Uh, we have said to ourselves in the meetings that we need more support in enforcement. And you know, what I mean, I'm not, I mean, I see this guy day in and day out, but there's, you know, one, I think we have two, right? One. One code enforcement officer. It's impossible. You know what, a good point, Fred, what, what I might suggest, and I'm not trying to throw anybody on the bus here, but maybe direct, if we could direct staff to, you know, go back and look and report back to us what you see, you know, if you think you need some more help, if you can, what we can do. I think there's a combination of, you know, uh, part of it is communication too. If, because again, some of the things we brought up earlier, you know, there may be some areas where people see, quote, clear True. cutting, but it's just cut zoom and, and brush, and it looks terrible once they come back. But if we could communicate that, you know, hey, here's, here's what's gonna happen. Right now they're taking this out, but they gotta plant this back or whatever when it's done, it's gonna look a whole lot better. I mean, maybe we can work on a combination of, of uh, if we need to have more uh, support with our staff out there um, to enforce it, but then also communicating what's going on with the building. Very you important, know, the communication. Right, even if, uh, and maybe with new communications, uh, we have a blurb that goes out every time something new is going, hey, development on Freemanville and next. Here's what's going on, you know. They're clearing off and then taking this out, but they've got a great landscape plan and be back. You know, sorry for the inconvenience right now. You'll see some, it won't look really good, but hey, you know, six months from now, it'll look beautiful, that kind of thing. But, well, you know, they, yeah. um, and, and uh, I don't take saying this lightly because I don't think the city of Atlanta does many things well, but you know, they always have signs up that say, you know, issuance of a building permit, you know, and, or tree removal permit or this, that, or the other. At least that puts, you know, folks on notice that they can go on and click on this website or something like that and and see what's going on what if along with the permit side they had to include a copy of landscape plan that was permanently there that people could go up and at least see what it looked like a lot of times those plans are on site uh, should be with LBT plans but, but they're not actually in with the the, the permit box so that People passing by don't really know what's right. there. Your LDPs usually might will be rolled up in the queue there, but yes, your individual and your smaller projects, it may not be. Because uh, it would be, you know, it would be nice to be able just to, if you see something and wonder what's going on there, you could pull off and, you know, look it up very quickly. I don't know if that's, I agree to hear you, but I don't know if that's necessarily the the safest way to achieve that. Yeah, maybe. Or, or have one, a number on it that, that says, you know, this such and such number, yeah. go to the website and look yeah. at so, some way that people can get the information because I think that's part of our problem is communication. Well, that goes back to communicate. Yeah, if we can. Yeah. That's our chance. Yeah. I mean, that's terrible. I have to admit, the first thing I asked Carter when I came in today is what happened to all those trees in front of Strawberry Fields? And I didn't realize round, it was the city. So, but yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I, you know. Yeah, the, the community members I know were upset, but I was too. So uh, yeah, I felt better once I knew what it was. So I think if we can get communication out, that helps. Great. When we talk about enforcement, and I guess put, use Bill's term to put some teeth into it, that seems to be part of the problem. And I think, aren't we concurrently, at, while we're considering this, also looking at improving and enhancing, uh, strengthening our tree ordinance? Because that's part of where we've seen a lot of issues is it's a lot easier to say, well, I'll pay into a recompense fund, but I just took down that big oak tree, but I'll pay you X number of dollars and it'll never go back on that site, but now I've got my clear cut space. And I guess, in, and that even goes into not just the buffer, but interior to the development of subdivision. What are we, what's our tree ordinance say and how are we gonna actually do it? Because it's not just along the roadway, that's you know the, a key, but where you have seen, you know, like, I, I don't even want to use the Cambridge reference, but there were some beautiful old oak trees there, right. and they just got, and they, they were fenced off first, and then all of a sudden, boom, they were gone to the point that there's nothing out there now. So the, the question is, how do we enforce that? Because obviously today, the way it's written, 
it doesn't carry a lot of weight because people still say, oh, it's a lot cheaper for me to do this, so I'm just going to take them down and I'll pay the penalty afterwards. Are we still lo are we looking at changing the tree ordinance? Absolutely. We're Absolutely. in the process right yeah. now. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 We're advertising for a consultant to help us with that. And um, okay. within the month, we should have someone on board, and we're going to start a rewrite of that ordinance. Okay. And I guess that, along with, like, like Fred was suggesting, if we can, from an enforcement standpoint, just on all these things, if we just, it sounds like we're going to put some more things in there as far as the review process, know what it looks like ahead of time. Question is, Okay, here's what it looked like ahead of time. What happens if I oops and I cut all the stuff down? Do we stop that? Do we stop that pull, developer on pull that the project? Pull the permit. Yeah. Yeah. It'll only happen once. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you stop, you do. stop work order? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I think those things are what we've got to look at because otherwise, if it's just ooh, sorry, that's what we've seen a lot over the last few years is people will, will do it without no ask for forgiveness and keep moving on. But you know, to that point, and maybe. When I ask if, if staff can kind of look at enforcement and if you need support and, and, and what our needs are, maybe you could give us some statistics on how often, if that help, happens a whole lot. Because I know a lot of times it gets, you know, it may, anytime you ride by and say, hey, you know, they took these trees down and weren't supposed to, but, you know, maybe it was in their plan and they are recompensed by planting more trees or whatever. It'd be nice to kind of know. How many citations, or how often you go to where somebody actually took down trees that they shouldn't have taken down? I'll pull what we have. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you guys for coming. Do you guys have any other closing comments, or whatever? Hey, now we're early. <laughs> <Okay>. Not you. <laughs> but seriously, we appreciate number one all the hard work and time, and, and also just coming to meet with us again and all that. Thank you. Thank you. you. So you guys have to stay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll just go ahead and we're going to go ahead and move into our uh, regularly scheduled work session. We've got two items on our agenda. Public comment is allowed that is germane to those items. If you wish to speak, you're required to fill out a public comment card and turn it into the city clerk. Public comment is allowed for a total of 10 minutes per agenda item and two minutes per person. Public comment will be heard at the beginning of the item. Do we have any public, we're getting some public comments now. All right, I'll give just a second for public comment on these two items. Does anybody in the audience have not, that wants to speak, have not turned in a card? Sure. We'll give a couple minutes there on that or, or we know that uh, this gentleman is going to be given a card. Um, the city, I'll ask you to call the first agenda item. First item is discussion of inconsistent AG1 zoned lot development standards along gravel roads contained in the subdivision ordinance section 5071-9 and the zoning ordinance section 6441-416-E2 and to seek direction from the mayor and the city council. Okay. Yeah, Thank you, sir. Um, let's see, I have passed out. You should all have um, uh, the uh, subdivision regs, which is the section 50 71, um, and then also on the second sheet, the uh, zoning uh, regulations section 64 416 development standards. And what I wanted to bring to you uh, tonight was a, an inconsistency. Um, in our codes between the subdivision and the zoning and um, um, and to seek your guidance because um, as the community development director um, I have the duty to interpret inconsistencies and um, so um, I would like to get your um, viewpoint in terms of how I should interpret and here is the issue the issue is that in the subdivision regs it speaks to um, uh, AG, AG zone land that is adjacent to or has access to unpaved roads and that each proposed lot shall contain a minimum area of three acres. So that's what the subdivision reg said. In the zoning uh, development standards it says, it's, it says that a minimum lot acre shall be as follows. One acre with frontage on paved road, three acres with frontage on unpaved road. 
so, so, so the zoning makes a distinction between pavement and non-paved. The subdivision regs only speak to the fact that when, when you have frontage on a gravel that it should be three um, uh, uh, acres. Now, my quandary is that many times I have um, lots that have frontage both on a paved road and on an unpaved road. And so, um, uh, so the quandary is how to in interpret that. Um, I have um, historically interpreted that if there is frontage on a paved road per the zoning, um, I can, I'm allowed to, to allow for one acre uh, for, um, for each uh, uh, residential lot. Um, regardless of whether it also fronts on a unpaved road. Um, I've discussed this with a city attorney. He feels that that is an appropriate um, interpretation. Um, however, um, if the council thinks that I should interpret this differently, um, there is room for um, a written opinion to be developed on this that I could use as the basis for my interpretations in the future. And Ken, I don't know if yeah, you want to say me, any more to that, but. Kathy, thank you. Let me, um, let me explain how, we, how I got there. And first of all, let me say at the outset that I do agree, first of all, with Kathy's interpretation. Um, looking at the two provisions, you've got one in, in Chapter 50 and then one, of course, in the Zoning Code. First of all, as with anything, uh, forgive me for the prism that I look at, 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 at issues from, but it's always going to be kind of what a court would do, right? What would a court do if they were looking at these two provisions? How would a court construe them? So we need to go through a couple of standards of statutory construction, so I will bore you to tears. I'm very fun at cocktail parties, but this sort of talk. But the bottom, first of all, a couple of things to think about. First of all, in reviewing an ordinance, and of course we have a Milton City Code, so it's an entire code, it's an entire body, it's not all these independent. Used to be the case, but when there was a state statute that said we had to codify all of our ordinances, uh, all jurisdictions in Georgia now have to do that. You have to codify all of your ordinances to make them all part of a unified whole. That's one thing to keep in mind. And therefore, when a court looks at 50 and 64 and all these various provisions, first of all, they're going to construe them together and they're going to do what's, quote, harmonize them if possible. In other words, that means that a court looking at provisions like this is, is going to want to make them make sense as drafted. What courts do not like to do is take a piece of code and throw it out and say, you know, that doesn't make any sense. That, that, that's purely superfluous. They don't like to do that. They want to construe them uh, to make sense. So first of all, you have chapter 50, which speaks to a specific issue, which is lots in AG1 on unpaved roads. It does not mention, as best I can tell, anything having to do with lots in AG1 on paved roads. It is silent. So chapter 50 is silent on that. However, chapter 64 is not, which is, by the way, your zoning code, and it speaks to both issues. So there's one statutory construct that says, all things being equal, if there is a specific statutory section that addresses the specific issue, the specific controls over the general. That's number one. Number two is the, link, the, the, the language in your zoning ordinance altogether, which says, the zoning ordinance shall abrogate, which means to annul, cancer, revoke, or destroy. The zoning ordinance shall abrogate any other regulations previously adopted or issued that are in conflict with any provisions of the zoning code. That's very typical in Georgia, well, that's very typical probably everywhere, is that zoning regulations representing probably the best manifestation of the will and vision of the council control over anything that is at odds with it. So Ms. Fields, and I don't want to you know, tell you what their justification was, but Kathy probably did what every other planning and community director in Georgia would do, and that is if you've got two code provisions and one of them's in your zoning code, they're going to defer to your zoning code because that is considered typically to be the highest and best manifestation of your intention as opposed to, for, for instance, your subdivision regulations. So if a court was looking at this, number one, they look at that, that statutory language that says zoning control, zoning code control. They look at that, that would be important. And then they would also look at the subdivision regulations and say, okay, well, the subdivision regulations do speak to what you do with AG1, three acre lots and unpaved roads. But it doesn't really speak to what you do on AG1 lots with paved roads. Oh, but your zoning code does. And therefore, I can readily reconcile those two. Zoning code on uh, AG1 on paved roads gets one acre lots. AG1 on unpaved roads get three acre lots. Easy. The one thing you may want to keep in mind, uh, though, is why the difference? 
why is there a difference on unpaved roads requiring a much bigger build out versus paved roads requiring a smaller build out? It's likely, now you tell me, but it's likely the, the reason is because that, in, that a paved road can simply handle more stuff, whether it's public safety vehicles or whether it's infrastructure in, installation or whatever it is, it can handle more. Because another uh, uh, mechanism by which courts interpret code provisions is, and you actually have this embodied in your zoning code, so that's good, or you're in your codification of codes, is what is the evil you know, I'm metaphorical. What is the metaphorical evil that the code is attempting to address? And if the concern is, is that a paved road can handle more improvements than an, than an unpaved road, and you've got a, a, a lot that's, that's bounded by both paved and unpaved, well then of course gonna say, well then therefore the, the evil of the bigger lot is addressed because there's a paved road that access that same piece of property. And therefore, once again, we would uphold Kathy's interpretation. Yes. Would there, would there be a way, Ken, to actually put it, when you have this where you've got on both sides, let's say a subdivision that comes off from a paved road, but then it goes, winds back in, and then the back of the subdivision abuts a, a gravel road. Yes. Would there be a way to do a review? I mean, if it's on a corner, right on the front corner, that may be an easy one saying, okay, that but still to do a review process, because I would say not, not, not only is it because it can handle more infrastructure and, and uh, right. vehicles, but I think the people that are living there today that are, are on those gravel roads that have the three acres to five acres, yep. if all of a sudden we have property that come back, comes back and abuts it, and all of a sudden now we've got more density than what they had planned on and what they're surrounded by could not if we put a review if you have one of those circumstances couldn't we do it as a review you you, you could you, Catherine Morg, the, the, the whole point of my explanation was to try and sort of tell you why the reason why I agree with Kathy but if the council says yeah but there's that difference you've got the the chapter 50 reg and the chapter 64 reg we want to we want to further expand those or we want to provide some additional clarity of course the council can do that you could you could revise this language as much as you want to to add any additional sorts of reviews you want to. I'm simply opining why I think she's right. Let, let me make a statement then, Karen. Um, you know, the reality is the three-acre minimum lot on a gravel road in Fulton County, you know, that's existing. And to Ken's point, it was very likely put in place years ago because of infrastructure. Yes. And it, it was back then, I'm sure the county wasn't trying to limit growth or, or density or whatever. They were probably welcoming in it. So it was all about the infrastructure, like you said. You know, fast forward now, I think where we have to make the decision, it makes sense, um, you know, structurally for a, a development to, or a gravel road to only have three acre minimum lots because there's less traffic and, and wear and tear and, and whatnot. Um, so that totally makes sense. You know, Going past that, if you've got a development of a neighborhood coming up to it and they have paved access, then it kind of nullifies the need. And to your point with Kathy, that's the, the probably the, the technical reason why it, it should be allowed. What we've got to make the decision is, do we want to use, you know, not really using the uh, infrastructure argument, but more of a viewshed argument yes. that, you know, yes. we want to use it as a uh, way to uh, have less density. And so we've got to make the decision that, you know, that's the reason we want to keep the three acre minimum and not so much because they're getting access to the gravel road, but because maybe it's a view shed off of the gravel road or. And, and, and Georgia law, Mr. Mayor, is very clear that aesthetics by itself is a legitimate public purpose by which cities and counties can adopt zoning codes and use their police power protection. So if, for instance, the city council wanted to say, if you own a property on AG1 that is adjacent or fronts a unpaved road, irrespective of whether you also have access to or are adjacent to a paved road, your build out shall be three acres. That would be perfectly fine. Okay. Perfectly fine. Because my point, I, you know. It would be aesthetic based. Though, right? I, I would be okay with that, but I think we've got to be realistic, and that's the reason we're doing it. We're not going back to the, 
old rule that the reason that it's three acre minimum is because of you know improvement yeah, infrastructure it's, it's 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 because of that Karen no I, I agree um, since I was involved with Fulton County way probably back then, yeah right um, I will tell you it was because of infrastructure I mean that's the reason and if it, it was a very clear delineation between whether or not your access was to the unpaved road or the paved road if your access was to the paved road one acre unpaved road three acres it was I mean it was very plain and simple now I'm not saying that's the way we want to keep it but that's why it was I think what you got to look at is if you do want to make changes to protect the rural view shed then what's to keep somebody from not buying the last 20 feet of property adjacent to an unpaved road so that their property is doesn't have access to that unpaved road and they can still put the lots in so you know you got to think if, if you want to if you want to uh, to get around that how to do it so that you know you, know, you could you probably address that want. with a buffer you know 60 80 foot minimum so that if somebody didn't sell the last 20 feet they really would have to not sell the but Bert, you know you, you yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> so Ken what you, you're saying as it's written now you that's why you agree with with Kathy's interpretation that's correct. however if we change 64 four sixteen you would agree with the interpretation if it, if it was in harmony with with 50. yeah absolutely the best the best method for interpreting the uh, code is the literal words in the piece of paper so the further more you enhance it the more you clarify it the less me or Kathy have a job of interpreting so the reason you agree with it is because of the way the two were written and if, if those two change then you can agree with interpreting absolutely <clears throat> interpreting that way too absolutely well I would I would at least at a minimum agree with with Rick's suggestion of, of at least looking at the the lots that would back up to I guess the the um, the gravel roads being a minimum three acres but I could also just as easily go with gravel three acres if it touches it anywhere no matter where you access it from yeah I think Karen's point we'd have to be careful with somebody trying to somebody yes split so things up. I mean but I, yeah. I, I think it is I think it's important um, well, we have 13 miles of gravel roads and you know it's uh, kind of nice to drive down the gravel roads and people enjoy them and it is kind of funny I, I catch myself driving down the gravel road and you know kind of enjoying it and all of a sudden you look to one side and there's a subdivision and you see you know a bunch of houses right there uh, on uh, you know smaller lots and all that it kind of takes away from it so since we only have 13 miles and it is a an asset to the city I certainly you know could support being pretty firm on that I think it would be a fairly modest tweak to actually section 64 416 to do that. You guys good with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, just to make sure what we were saying there, I would be in favor of the lesser of the two in terms of a conflict. So if the gravel road is there, the gravel road should win out over the paved road. And I, and I think when this comes back to us, we got to clarify that too. Does that mean? Somebody had a, I'm just make up a number, 100 acre parcel, and if it touched the gravel road, does that mean all 100 acres, or to the point, any lots that are attached to the gravel road? If there's three acre, and right. we probably have to have a. Well, typically the, the, the beauty of Section 64 though is its development standard, so it's it's based upon when there's actually a submittal for an LEP, and that's when Kathy's probably starting her review and looking at what's applicable versus what's not. Is that fair? Right. Yeah. So it's it's not going to matter generically. It's only when they bring in the. The, the, the building permit up or the land service permit application and seeing what actually is in play to be developed okay. before we finish talking about this um, we've got some public comment right so you're on the side of okay Go and, call that. and that's mr. Cleveland Slater Cleveland Slater, 1670 Bethany Road, Milton. Um, I'm sharing with you the, the um, two ordinances. We talked about the subdivision and the zoning ordinance and also included um, the definitions from section 50 um, where it defines double lots and multiple lot frontage. Um, and we've heard one explanation about um, the differences in paved roads and unpaved roads with respect to the frontage. 
But I like to say the frontage does not go away when you pave a road inside a subdivision. You still have frontage on the unpaved road. Uh, I, I was not aware until I think just last night that our ordinances actually define a double or multi frontage lot. Uh, and with that definition, I think it makes it very clear the intent is to maintain three acre minimum lot sizes uh, when a lot is adjacent to a road, an unpaved road. Um, we talked about, I've heard discussion about historically what, is, what has happened or what has been done, what Milton has done. This was a theoretical discussion when we were talking about Ebenezer, um, but it became real when a recent subdivision was uh, permitted on Nix Road and uh, Freemanville Road, uh, where three lots that are adjacent to a gravel road were permitted at uh, one acre minimum lots. Um, there may be, that might be a place where a variance would be appropriate, but I think that's a decision that council should make and look at that particular situation whether a variance is appropriate at that, at that location and not a blanket, let's interpret this and make it apply throughout the city uh, based upon what, what happened at Freemanville and Nix. Fulton County, who had actually different ordinances than we do, okay, we adopted Fulton, uh, but when we adopted Fulton ordinances, we added some additional language. Uh, Fulton did not have the adjacent to language they do now, but it was added more recently. Um, Fulton County, two times in 1997, approved subdivision of one acre lots on gravel roads. There's 19 lots in white columns and there are 12 lots in Sable Point of one acre that adjoin uh, or adjacent to a gravel road. What Fulton County did historically though should not set precedent what the city of Milton is going to do. The city of Milton was, was created in a large part because we were unhappy with the decisions that Fulton County were, were making and we wanted local control. And this is one time I hope that council will exert local control. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all the public comment on this item? Okay. And, and again, in closing on this item, that's, you know, again, we were stating that we, you know, we're understanding why Fulton County had that ordinance, but we're not necessarily agreeing with it. We're, we're tweaking it too. That what we believe is the right thing for milk. May I just get to a point of clarification? I'm, I'm not clear. Do you, do you want us to draft language that says um, um, just those lots that back up to a uh, gravel road or any uh, parcel that backs up to a gravel road? I think there's a big difference. In terms you know, of again, I think, like I said earlier, this goes to an absolute rule where it could get used against us if. I think it totally makes sense to all lots if it were a certain number of lots, but then again, my, and, and we may not have this situation, but you know, say there was a hundred acre parcel and you know, only 20 feet of it touched a gravel road. Does that, or, or is it the adjacent lots? And that's the decisions, you know, that's something we got to discuss. And, and it may be that we just do it such that no lot, no house can be within a certain number of feet of the gravel road if it is on a, paved road so that way you don't have a bunch of houses on a paved road backing up to a gravel road I think that's what we want to avoid. yeah I, and, and I think the probably the answer to that is definitely have it to where no lot that is adjacent to a gravel road whether it's pa it has paved access or not is less than three acres I think that would be the double frontage yeah. type yeah. That's yeah. It. That's um, roads. Yeah. so the but then because if you know, like I said if you had a blanket to a parcel Somebody would get creative and say, okay, we're cutting this 20 feet off this parcel. And, you know, and we're donating that for land, you know, for Maybe. preservation or something. So is that council okay on that path with the adjacent well, I'm not, lots? I'm not so, sure if uh, Kathy and, and Ken are together on this. Maybe Ken could uh, just briefly articulate the uh, direction he thinks he's had it. Well, what, what I was going to recommend was, and again, you know, obviously subject to me and Kathy talking about it, was to modify section 64 or 416 development standards. It currently reads, minimum lot area shall be as follows. One acre with frontage on paved road, three acres with frontage on unpaved road. If a lot fronts both an unpaved road and, an, and a paved road, the three acre minimum shall apply. So how do you keep somebody from just not buying the 10 feet adjacent to the unpaved road and still putting them in. Well, I, I think mean, you have a problem with the seller not wanting to keep well, 20 feet of Yeah, but it's... I mean, it's, it's, 
It, yeah, I mean, we could go down, because I agree with you, Councilmember Thurman. I mean, we've all been doing this long enough to know that people get creative on people how to travel. People get creative, the, and they'll find a way the, to, the, you know, the, just the track through. Well, can you do your setback? Um, well, you can do, keep two feet of you the can do a, larger, a larger setback right. to where that would yeah. negate any value that someone yeah. would have by having the smaller lots. I, I think, well, a couple of thoughts. Number one, I mean, there's probably already requirements right now in the Milton Code that you can't create a lot that is unbuildable. And so there's probably some minimum lot requirements right now that would prevent somebody from sort of gaming the system that way by trying to, to carve out a little one by one foot acre lot. So, I mean, Kathy, I gotta believe we have the tools right now to, to stop that, that nonsense if it begins to happen. Right. right. That, that would be yeah. my thought. Right. And candidly, my, well, my, I, would, I would recommend let's do this. And then if we see any, any, any attempts at abusing it, we'll, we'll address those. Yeah. And just one other, you know, maybe option two was to your point Karen you could you know have maybe a I'll make a pun again but a hundred foot setback or something yeah. to a property line that way it would be substantial enough that it serves two purposes the gravel road you're not going to have homes right up on it number two it's a substantial enough property the developer have to say well gosh I might as well just do those as three acre lots then you know yeah. if I got to give up a hundred foot strip of you know, 12 acres or whatever it would be but uh, yeah I think I think you guys know the intent what we're talking about okay. we need to bring something back that we can discuss and decide on yeah and again I don't I don't see this as being a very terribly complicated fix at all okay anybody else all right Thank you. We'll call the next item soon next item final item is discussion of equestrian stakeholder group I do have five public comments. You know what, I may, if it's okay with the council, let the public make yeah. the comments first, because then sometimes we can address things. I think they were on the, they were on the gravel roads. Oh, gravel roads. Oh, they were? Okay. Yeah, they were all on gravel roads. Oh, well, I'm so. sorry. Well, let's, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and hear the gravel Let's hear them. Okay. I'm sorry. Here we go. And the first is Laura Bentley. Laura Bentley, 2500 Bethany Church Road. So thank you very much. That I don't, I don't even need to say anything. That the that discussion was perfect. The intent was captured. I think you know that what you just spoke of saves green space. Um, it reduces our density, and you know it's near and dear to my heart. I, I the only thing I don't like about my place is that it's not on a gravel road. So those neighborhoods are special. Um, and, and there's more people here to speak about that, so I'll, I'll okay. refer to them. Thank you. Thank you. So if you'll call the next speaker. Next speaker is Arroyo Blackwell. Good evening. I'm Roy Blackwell. I live at 1365 Nix Road. It is a gravel road. I've been there for 23 years. I've had every opportunity to move to White Columns, to move to any of the subdivisions around, I love my gravel road. I'm there to protect it. Um, my lot adjoins the construction that's going on on two sides, the construction on Freemanville and Nix Road. Um, the three lots beside my house between the Nix Road are the ones that they're talking about limiting and putting three houses on. To save on density, to save on the, the way that the ordinance are written, it's one house for those three acres. Um, I'll be wrapped. I've been there 23 years and I've had woods all around me and that's what I intend uh, to stay there. Um, I can't stress enough of how I want the committee to, to the council to uh, uphold the, the one house per three acres. Um, I think it's important and if we're talking about the view and what people are going to see when they come down the dirt roads that they love in Milton, they're going to see four houses right along that road, right at the end at Freemanville Road. And uh, I would just like to see you consider upholding the ordinances the way they are. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So if you'd please call the next speaker. The next speaker is Diane Maloney. Hey there, thank you guys for everything you do for Milton. Um, Diane Maloney, 14420 and 14430 Wood Road. I was just going to read my email um, that I sent to council just because I wanted to make sure you all heard. 
Um, let's see, as a resident on one of the few gravel roads left in the city of Milton, I would like you all to know that I'm in full support of your maintaining the three acre minimum lot size for properties in the city of Milton on or adjacent to gravel roads. The gravel roads are part of the Milton Trail system and there is a 15 mile an hour limit, speed limit on Wood Road and I can tell you firsthand um, on Wood Road um, that it's heavily used by a lot of Milton residents. I mean, you turn off of Freemanville onto Phillips Circle and there's always cars parked there. Lots of residents use it um, as a uh, park system. So um, it's, it's definitely um, not just enjoyed by the people that live on gravel roads, but by everybody. Um, let's see, what else did I want to say? Um, the Milton um, High School cross country teams have trained on Wood Road since we moved there 15 years ago. And this part of the trail system, like um, the other gravel roads, are sites of heaven. The very essence of Milton, and it's a Milton we all love. It's mostly horse farms, rural, and it's safe, and it's the Milton that you said you guys would protect if you were elected. So I hope you uphold this. And um, let's see, I just wanted to make one other comment too about. Um, the use of the gravel road um, for the infrastructure. I think people would still use the gravel road even if there was um, subdivisions on the end. You can't just preclude that because there's a paved road that people would not use the gravel road because I still, still think it would definitely impact the use of the gravel road. So just think about that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Sadie, if you'll call the next speaker. The next speaker is Brian Maloney. Brian's still here. Feels the same way. We'll do what you say, right? Read better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sue. Next. Ne next one. Last one is Jason Blackwell. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Jason Blackwell. I live at 1365 Next Road. Um, I just want to say that I believe that three acre ordinance is a great thing because when you drive up and down my road and you pass the houses in white columns it takes away from that and uh, and I, I plan on inheriting my house which sits right there and if three houses come up next to it it takes away from my personal enjoyment of my home because this is where I've grown up um, another thing is that they bulldozed before the erosion fences came up and there's a creek that runs under Freemanville right through my backyard and now there's a bunch of debris from the storms that's in my yard now. So that's another issue there. Okay. Thank you, Jason, for speaking. And uh, I think there might be a little hint there. Staff could check something out. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else to? That's all, sir. Okay. That's all the uh, next item. Discussion of equestrian stakeholder group, Mr. Steve Kofa. I don't really know that my name is appropriate to be on there. Um, I know we uh, we were talking about this since last year's uh, last year's uh, uh, council retreat. Uh, council member Coons asked me to uh, add this to today's uh, agenda, so I I turn that over. Could we start? You know, I was like, Councilmember could speak, and, and basically, you know, as we have been working on the past, and said, where where are we with it at this point? What is? I know last time we talked, staff was working on it. Where are we, or not? You know, at what point are we? Our uh, communications manager was in the process of uh, of uh, looking at that as part of her her strategic plan, um, and then. Uh, Councilmember Coons brought it up a, a couple of meetings ago, and uh, I think it was time that we uh, just make sure we achieve alignment. All right, All right, yeah, okay. You want to take me? Yeah, I mean, obviously, with um, you know, being here with, in the city and our logo being a horse, and, and so much of what we have promised our citizens about what is rural, I think um, a lot of our equestrian aspect of our community has been at risk for a long time. Um, and there's a lot of ways to achieve an objective of trying to maintain that very aspect of it. Now granted, granted there's many aspects of what is rural within the city, but I do believe that if we do fight for the equestrian aspect of our community, as many cities in the United States have done, such as Lexington, for example, we can achieve 
at least a better spirit towards what it is we're trying to become. And obviously we're facing a strong economic condition that is driven mainly by having quality schools in here. Um, but we also need to help our equestrian nature if that is something we want to promote. And in doing so, I think that um, I think that we need to have a process in place that actually brings ideas forth that will help equestrian-based businesses, equestrian-based property, um, and the promotion of the equestrian spirit within the city of Milton. That involves people. That involves um, the people that actually have the horses, that have the land, to get together and have those communications. Um, what I would like to see in some format is this council to decide or instruct staff, um, perhaps doing a resolution or a um, or a, 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 a set of rules for a body, whether it be like the um, Planning Commission where each of us appoint someone, um, or a body like Milton Grove Green where we appoint a head and then they have multiple people underneath it. I'd prefer long term that it was a body on its own that would come before the council to bring ideas. Um, but it might need us to each appoint someone at the beginning to bring people together that can have ideas um, brought together in a meeting environment and come to us as a council with ideas for that objective. So that was the idea that I wanted to have with the discussion of creating an equestrian stakeholder group. Um, I think it's something that we do need to have where I'm willing to talk is whether we have um, how we want to format what that body would look like and what it should, um, what the rules ought to be, whether it be like a Milton Grove Green or whether it be, we want to be as formal as a planning commission or maybe the historical preservation commission might be something too. The ideas I do have is, you know, maybe if we have individuals that we appoint, you know, some requirements as such as they own a horse, um, whether they're a property owner as well, is something we can debate, um, live in the city, um, but like the historical preservation commission, not subject to districts, um, where we can pick anybody within the city that we would choose. And just my thoughts. You know, and those are great thoughts, I, because sometimes there is a disconnect in what, I forget the number percentage of people in Milton that actually own a horse, but it's you know Small. two or three percent. Six percent. Six. Mm -hmm. It was a seven at one point, seven. but um, but what those other 93, 95 percent folks or whatever, what they want to see and what most people want to see is they do want to see the equestrian part of Milton, although they have really no connection or no financial interest or, or whatever, and so a lot of times and and you know rightfully so, drive down and say, oh, they're, we're losing another horse farm. But they don't realize that property owner and horse farm is who's paying the bills and the taxes and the upkeep and all that. So um, so what, what would be good about this is we could, could, if we can comprise this committee, as Matt said, of people that are actually on that side. It's a small percentage. We would have to do it, um, no districts, but at large, right. because there's not, you know, we'd have to spread. But maybe that group, that actually, you know, are the, the equestrian community could get together and come to us with things that might benefit them. Whereas the regular public wants us to go, well, you need to save the horse farms and you need to do this. But the reality is we need the horse community, equestrian community to come to us to say, this is what would really help us. This is what would really improve, you know, uh, the equestrian community here and, and enable us to, to stay or attract more more uh, equestrian stuff, so I, I think it's a, it would be really good to get input from that, that group, and maybe it's, a, you know, not necessarily a planning commission type group, but a, a citizens group that we put together that comes to us with recommendations and, you know, is, is, is a part of our other groups to, you know, work with the planning commission and right. things as, as future right. development goes, but, you know, I, I'm certainly open to that care yeah. yeah I would love to have the group come to really do some thinking as what in kind of incentives might help keep the horse farms in Milton because mm -hmm. I'm a strong believer in uh, if you want people to, to act a certain way you either incentivize them to act that way or you require them and you get a whole lot more with honey than you do with vinegar so uh, you know I'd much rather find ways to try to incentivize the behavior we want which is to keep the, the horse farm <coughs> Yeah. I think uh, the discussion not only should center around how to preserve what we have here, but how do we uh, really promote uh, the industry and even attempt to expand it. So, uh, 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of folks out here. Of course, they come from different parts of the industry, and I, uh, I wouldn't want to limit it just to seven folks on a, a board like that. It should have some structure, I believe, but uh, uh, I think it needs to be all inclusive. Uh, let's bring in all all uh, members of the uh, equestrian community, and so. Perhaps we could appoint seven, you know, I, a minimum yeah. of seven that are appointed, and, yeah, then, right. and then I would, I would say, uh, yeah. formally, we would have seven, but then they would bring in all the right. rest. You know, they just like there's seven of us, we listen to everybody. I so. think you'll get more participation if you if everybody has appointed mm -hmm. one person, and that person knows that they're appointed to show up. Mm -hmm. But their job would be to reach the entire community, okay. right? Anybody else? Yep. Joe. Let me make sure I understand, because Rick and I are sort of in a different situation <laughs> because, you know, District 3 is pretty small. And, uh, and while I won't say there's no horse, horse pastures, I'm sure there are horse owners. There's one, there's one on Bethany. Down yeah. Horse. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's, 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 it's a toy horse. Yeah, it's pretty small. So but uh, anyway, it's so be in favor of having some flexibility in terms of where we I yeah. think we said it. We do it at large. Oh, okay. yeah, you can, large. Pick, you large. can pick anybody. Yeah. You know, probably the majority of the seven will be in the probably one or two districts. Right. I think this other thing. Whenever we form any new committee, I think it, it would be key to really look at what are the goals and objectives that we want this group to do. I think Karen hit on uh, a good point too. I mean, what can we do to incentivize? Are there things that we can work on? Or those would be the folks that probably could give us the best ideas, knowing what they face and how we could possibly help them. I'm wondering if the right and the fairest way to do this would be, and help me out here, Ken, or our staff, um, if each council member chooses a, a, a representative, and obviously you're gonna have to reach out to folks and make sure that they're, they're, you know, they're willing and wanna be involved, and then have kind of a kickoff meeting where they hash out some of the, goals and with staff's help come up with a list and then present it back to us and we can tweak it. These are the goals, here's the answers we want, here's what we want you guys to work on. So rather than trying to do that first and then getting volunteers, I think we'd get more input from folks that are actually in the equestrian side. Well, may, maybe an idea too is if you want to if you want to start that out, actually make it more of a community meeting, community meeting and so it's more inclusive from the front end and then listen to what people say before we actually get into the formal appointment of different people just an idea and just just one thing to add and again all this sounds it sounds great it, but just be mindful that if it is a city created committee then it is subject to the meetings act agendas notice maybe even a little bit of staff time you got to run meet minutes you got to have 20 48 hour uh, meeting summaries just some of the extra layers of I hate to say it but some you know, bureaucracy right. that they go along with but I think the good thing is that will actually help promote it and okay. the awareness, right. you know, the, the, the public can have access to that. So I, I, I would recommend, and you guys are open to any comments on this, mm -hmm. though, that maybe we set up where um, everybody thinks about and talks to some folks and picks a person and then have a meeting with them and then come up with some criteria that you want them. Because, again, like I said, in the beginning, everybody, I'd say 99% of the people in Milton, love the equestrian theme of the park, but only 6 or 7% actually get it. So those are the people that I think need to come up with the things that are important and uh, the guidelines and the, and the goals. So does that make sense? You guys, staff, have any recommendation on that? I can throw with that, yeah. Okay. I think so, we're ready to roll. So maybe you guys can reach out to us, but everybody keep in mind somebody that you may want to uh, pick on that. So. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. We'll adjourn.